it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV. It's not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning. Welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from 10 until 1. What a show we've got for you today. The Prime Minister has sacked the Home Secretary, Swilla Bravman, with a wider cabinet reshuffle taking place right now. James Cleverley has taken up the role as the new Home Secretary, moving from the Foreign Office. And guess who's back? David Cameron, former Prime Minister, is to be the new Foreign Secretary. This all comes after a week of speculation over Swella Bradman's permission, position sorry, after she was accused of stoking tensions ahead of the Armistice Day protest. A total of 145 people were arrested on Saturday during the pro-Palestinian march and far-right counter-protest. We're going to be talking about all of that throughout the show. And my question to you today is very simple. Sacking of Home Secretary Swella Bradman. Was it the right decision? Tell us why it was, tell it why it wasn't. You can also uh, give us a call on 0344 499 text on 8722, or tweet us on X at Talk TV. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. Starting with the breaking news that James Cleverley has been confirmed as the new Home Secretary after Suella Braverman was sacked by the Prime Minister. Rishi Sunak's been under pressure to get rid of his Home Secretary over accusations she stoked tensions at this weekend's protests in London. Well, in response, Suella says, It's been the greatest privilege of my life to serve as Home Secretary and I'll have more to say in due course. The Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, has told Talk TV the PM didn't take action soon enough. His weakness in tolerating Suella Braverman for so long is entirely to blame for the appalling spectacle we saw last week where a Home Secretary undermined the police, undermined public confidence in the police and used her position to pour petrol on the flames of a very difficult situation. Meanwhile, the former Prime Minister David Cameron's also been seen going into number 10 as Rishi Sunak continues to reshape his top team. There's speculation that Cameron could become Foreign Secretary. The Sun columnist Rod Liddles told us he thinks it's a disastrous decision. It's remarkable that they should think that the public would be sort of gasping for another bit of David Cameron uh, because we haven't had enough in the past. Remarkable. Uh, and it means that there'll be kind of outright civil war within the Conservative Party. It's probably the worst thing he could possibly have done. It's reported that five people have died and one person is missing after a house fire in West London. Around 70 firefighters battled the blaze overnight as it tore through a property in Hounslow. The ground and first floors of the mid-terraced house were destroyed as part of the roof uh, was also damaged. The father of Indy Gregory says he's angry after the eight-month-old at the centre of a legal battle died following the withdrawal of her life treatment support. Indy's parents wanted specialists to keep treating her rare condition that affected how her body used energy. Doctors went to the courts to let them stop treatment, saying she was in too much pain and distress. The Royal Mail has been fined £5.6 million for failing to meet its first and second class delivery targets in the last year. The organisation is required to deliver more than 90% of the posts sent with these services within one and three days. And thousands of people are expected to pay their respects to one of England's greatest ever footballers by lining the streets of Manchester later on. Sir Bobby Charlton's funeral is this afternoon in the city's cathedral. He died earlier this month at the age of 86. Sammy McElroy is one of his former Manchester United teammates and will be at the service. He was just a complete package for me um, as a footballer. I mean, he, I, I'll never, ever, ever stop watching the goals that I scored. For Manchester United, for England, the sidestep, left left foot, right foot, thunderbolt shot, unbelievable. And uh, no, he, he will never, there'll never be another Bobby Charlton, Sir Bobby Charlton, sorry, never. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazni Gaffer.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's going to be uh, very wet this afternoon, incredibly windy for some areas as well, thanks to Storm Debbie. The Met Office do have warnings in force for much of uh, northern England and the northwest of Wales, an amber warning for the northwest of England, where the strongest winds are likely gusts up to 80 miles per hour. It's also looking very wet with spells of rain that will be heavy at times across Scotland and northern England, becoming a bit drier compared to this morning, though, for the rest of England, Wales and Northern Ireland, but there will be blustery showers, especially to the west of these areas. Now, overnight, Storm Storm Debbie eventually pulls off into the North Sea, as you can see, so it does become calmer with clear spells developing, but there will be plenty of blustery showers around, particularly down towards the southwest. I think there may be some merging to longer spells of rain there by the early hours of the morning for southwest to England. It will be a mild night, though. And then through tomorrow, we'll see the blustery showers continue. It won't be as windy as today, but some downpours could be quite heavy and thundery, especially down towards the southwest and across many southern counties of England and Wales. There could be some really hefty downpours during the morning, clearing by the afternoon though. Elsewhere we will see showers particularly across the north of the UK. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. Welcome back. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Well, extraordinary morning. The Prime Minister has sacked the Home Secretary, Swella Bradman, with a wider cabinet reshuffle taking place right now. James Cleverley has moved from the Foreign Office to take up the role as Home Secretary. This as extraordinary news this morning. David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, is to become the new Foreign Secretary. Well, today we're asking you. The Prime Minister sacking Home Secretary Swella Bradman. Was it the right decision? Tell us why. You can give us a call on 0344 499 1000. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. You can text on 8722 or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Uh, joining me right now to run through all of the top stories is commentator Sam Armstrong. But before that, let's get an update on today's big political news, the reshuffle, of course, with our chief political commentator, Peter Cardwell. Uh, good morning to you, Peter. Good morning, Julia. I mean, extraordinary day, it really is. What I find most extraordinary is the Home Secretary, Swella Bravman, basically said this protest that's going to take place, this pro-Palestinian protest on Saturday that's going to take place, is going to cause disorder. The anti-Semitic chants, the, the, the flags, insignia, um, is going to provoke action. I think it should be banned. The Prime Minister called in Sir Mark Rowley, the Met Chief, and said he thought that the protest should be banned. She wrote an article, did not get it signed off by Number 10. Yes, clearly that was not acceptable. Um, the, pro the protest went ahead. It was exactly as she has predicted it was. She was completely and utterly uh, proved right. And now she's been sacked. This is effectively your house being on fire and shout. And the person who shouts fire, fire has been sacked and been criticised instead of the person who set the house on fire in, its fir in the first place. What on earth is going on? It's an extraordinary political development that she has been sacked. It is absolutely uh, fascinating to see what has happened in the last few minutes uh, with David Cameron becoming Foreign Secretary, but on Suella Braverman particularly, whatever Rishi Sunak did with her, however he either kept her in the role, moved her or attempted to move her to a different position within the Cabinet, I imagine she would have strongly resisted that, or sacked her, which is the course of action he has taken. None of those moves was going to go well for him, and sacking her is a pretty nuclear option. It now allows her a lot more time to oppose him and to be running essentially her campaign, which has been going on for a while, to be the next leader of the Conservative Party. But there will be many, many people who think that she has been proven exactly right mm -hmm. in what she predicted and that Rishi Sunak is wrong to do this today. It is a huge political risk for Rishi Sunak to do. It's an extraordinary thing. And I think we will see, we will, I'm sure, hear a lot more for her. And now she's yes. completely off the leash. Yeah, Any well, control she, well, that he had on her is gone. She's written a statement saying, it has been the great privilege of my life to serve as Home Secretary. I will have more to say in due course. I'm very much sure that she will. Let's talk about who else has moved, what we know so far, because this is an extensive reshuffle. Often in recent years, reshuffles have been sort of either a last minute emergency, like Jeremy Hunt coming in after Kwasi Kwarteng was sacked. Um, well, Jeremy Hunt, we know, by the way, is staying as Chancellor. <laughs> 
you know, so the one person you know needs to be moved, definitely staying in his job, unsackable, it would appear. Um, but often it's just sort of a bunch of junior ministers who, frankly, no one's even heard of. Most of their parents didn't know they were in the cabinet or the shadow cabinet uh, or whatever. Um, but we, we're seeing James Cleverly move from foreign secretary to home secretary. He won't want to do that. Foreign Secretary has done him very well, hasn't he? He's been, he's a very popular, most popular member of the cabinet, according to members of the Conservative Party right now. Home Secretaries often aren't. Um, he's being, he's been given a dud deal, isn't he? It's a very tough job and Foreign Secretary is quite a nice job. And of course, James Cleverly, uh, as you say, topped the pool of Conservative Home, the sort of Bible website of Conservative Party members for the first time in the last few weeks. Home Secretary, very, very difficult job. Also following Suella Braverman into that, difficult for him. And David Cameron yes. as the new Foreign Secretary, extraordinary return for him. He had said previously that he quite fancied the rule, but lots of people say those things, they'd like a return to politics. Former Prime Minister as Foreign Secretary, it's extraordinary. I expect he will go to the House of Lords very, very soon, and that will happen. Uh, so uh, really extraordinary political developments in the last few minutes. Mm -hmm. And as you say, Many, a number of junior people going, Nick Gibb, who's been the schools minister for most of the last uh, 10 years or so on and off, a long serving minister, but pretty low profile. Also another fairly low profile minister called Neil O'Brien, he's gone. But you're absolutely right, Julia. This is an extensive reshuffle. We're going to see many more changes. And the team at the top, Jeremy Hunt staying, but four, uh, sorry, two of the big four roles have changed today. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I think there's some news about Theresa uh, Coffey and whether or not she's going to be out. Yes, she's been well, she's been seen entering number 10. She, of course, big ally of Liz Truss. Um, but again, not seen as a very effective minister. Um, bad news about Nick Gibb leaving, actually, because Nick Gibb's actually a very effective schools minister. Neil O'Brien, disgusting human being. Glad he's out. He's someone who set up a website to smear politicians, um, no, sorry, to journalists, politicians and scientists for questioning lockdown. He has no business being in our democracy whatsoever. So good riddance to him. But I think you're right. The most extraordinary story today really is David Cameron's extraordinary return to frontline politics. We'll come it, back it, to you it, later in the show. Any more developments on that? Uh, Peter Cardwell, our political commentator, thank you so much indeed for joining us. Let's come to Sam Armstrong, who is live in the studio with us, who I know is just chomping at the bit. Let's just talk Suella first up. She is out on her hair. She defied the Prime Minister. She said quite a lot of things over recently. She defied the Prime Minister with that article in The Times. Um, and that some of the language, I have to say, I wasn't there. Hate marchers, comparing the marchers um, with um, uh, those in, in Northern Ireland. Poor choice of language. I think she often undermines a sensible point with some fruity language. But she was proved right on Saturday. So how on earth has the Prime Minister decided to sack her? Yeah, and she was a, pro a politician that spoke for great swathes of the public. There are many, many people, in fact, the majority of this country agreed with her. Those protests should have been banned. And we always say, we always complain, we've done it here, you and I have complained, yeah. Julia, before, politicians that won't give a straight answer. Yep. She spoke, she said what she thought, she told it as it was, and the Prime Minister's reaction is having been proved right, having frankly agreed with her, as we saw yes. today, he was announcing exactly the same policy. So what she said was forward. terrible, but he's announcing that there should be new laws to crack down on extremist protests. So he's admitting in both the legislation he wants to bring forward and in what he said to Sir Mark Rowley, the Met chief, last week as well, that he agrees with her. Look, he, and then he's sacking her because he agrees with her. He wants right-wing policies that he thinks will get him re-elected, but he still wants to be popular at North London dinner He wants, North, to, be dinner he wants to be like... This is, this, is, this is the thing. Can I say, I've got a great quote, which I can't read out in full. I'm going to have to beep it a little bit from a, a senior figure, a very senior figure in the party, from the, a red wall seat, who won't, won't, can't come on the show, but said, but you can quote me as saying, he said, I'm beeped off. An awful lot of the party beeped off. That said, Suella Bravman doesn't actually have the right-wing constituency among Tory MPs that she has among Tory members and Tory voters. That is very much the case. She's seen as having sort of shot from the hip too many times. Uh, she says the right things, but she hasn't achieved enough. Um, bearing in mind, we've got the Rwanda Supreme Court decision coming on Wednesday. Wait to see how that goes. Um, but in terms of stopping the boats, but, but, but she, she hasn't got the constituency among Tory MPs. The thing is here, it seems to me, you've got a prime minister who, who way behind in the polls, Labour creeping up in the polls, even amid their massive dis, dis, you know, disarray over the issue of Gaza and Israel. Um, and, these, I mean, and, and some of the MPs supporting these horrific protest marches on Saturday. We've got that situation, that is happening. And here he is 
trying to appease the Labour Party. Where's Streeting, Shadow Health Secretary, saying Suella is entirely to blame for the events on Saturday, poured Petra on the flames, as if, as if all of these right-wing extremists and football hooligans were going to sit at home on Saturday and, you know, having, having, you know, having a cheese sandwich and a cup of tea, quite happily watching yet again as, as you know, as these, these some of them Islamist, pro-Hamas people march to our capital city intimidating people. And they were just going to go... And worries, concerns about the cenotaph. We've seen other other war memorials being desecrated by, with free Palestine or flags draped on them. But, yeah, those people were just going to sit at home and then Suella Braverman stands up and says this. They all read The Times, obviously, these people, and they all love a, an ethnic minority home secretary, even though, of course, they're white racists, right? And yet suddenly she says that and suddenly they're all out on the streets. This is no nonsense. And, and Rishi Sunak is pandering to this nonsense. Top to bottom, this is the reshuffle that The Guardian couldn't oh. have dreamed of. This is their favourite... What we're about to see is The Guardian's favourite Conservative yeah. cabinet that we've had in the last 15 years. But all of this begs the question, who is Rishi Sunak serving here? Because yeah. there are red wall constituencies up in the country whose views, the voters of those, those new coalition of voters, are far removed, very far removed, from the corpus of Tory MPs that are in Parliament. And what this reshuffle means is increasingly, day after day after day, Rishi Sunak is making a conscious decision mm. The 2019 realignments in this country, where working class people for the first time in a very long time said, Conservative Party, we're going to put our support in you, in Boris. That's gone. That's behind. Yeah. We're going back to the old way. And what a better symbol of return to the past yeah. than David Cameron walking up the street of Downing Street. Now, here's the thing. I rather like David Cameron. I think he was rather good, Prime Minister. He promised us a referendum, OK, only because of the threat from UKIP and, you know, Nigel Farage now busy down up. Nigel Farage will be absolutely kicking himself uh, not being uh, around for all of this going on. Um, but he's, go he's going to be appearing on I'm a Celebrity from this weekend and uh, I my hope we'll, we'll win it. Um, um, but, uh, but, you know, David Cameron promised a ref referendum and then actually gave us a referendum in 2016, um, even though most people assume, well, you just promise these things, but you don't actually go ahead with it. Um, he pretended to be Eurosceptic. He's not. Like most of those posh boys, he's actually, he's actually a complete Europhile, really. He thinks that the technocrats know better than, you know, us voter scum. Let's, let's be honest, that's what they all think. Um, and then I, he resigned. He felt that he couldn't push through, which, which was wrong, because he said he wouldn't resign. But, I mean... I don't, I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. And I think we shouldn't hold that against politicians. But you called it just there, a posh boy, hates Brexit, resigned in protest towards it. And now he is leading a government that was elected on a mandate of delivering Brexit, yeah. change from the past, talking straight embodying the, the values, the beliefs of working people up and down this country. And this government is looking, smelling, feeling like a very different beast, the opposite of what the anti-establishment yeah. vote in 2019 is. Yeah. And there will be many people, and I think if Nigel Farage wasn't uh, down under, he would be saying this, will call this an establishment coup yeah. to oh, undermine completely. the two great upsetting votes for the North London Wokerati of the last century. But, 2019, Boris, it, 2016, but, but of course, but they'll, but they'll get slaps on the back. Um, of, you know, the local dinner parties. I, sort of, um, I, I consume lots of different media in the morning. I've got sort of lots of phones and iPads and things going because I want to know what everyone's saying. Fascinating to see the likes of Beth Rigby, political editor on Sky News, saying, oh, David Cameron, the grown-ups are back in the room. What they mean by that is people we agree with. That's what they mean. People, we, although she doesn't really like the Tories, that's very obvious, but he's, an ex, he's the acceptable face of the Tories. But this is the thing. Rishi Sunak is so far, far behind in the polls. The things he said he wants to deliver on in terms of the economy, but also stopping the boats um, and, you know, maintaining our borders and, you know, the NHS, none of, none of these changes pushes us any further forward to that. And we know that the only reason the Tories were able to get in in 2019 with that magnificent majority was because of that appeal to working-class voters. When you sack the Home Secretary, who is, who is one of the few people speaking up and saying, this isn't going to fly with us anymore. As I said, when you, when you sack the one person who's saying, the house is on fire, the house is on fire, we have Islamist, pro-Hamas terrorists 
walking down our streets, shouting anti-Semitic slogans, flying anti-Semitic terrorist flags. Not the vast majority of people on those marches, but an awful lot of them. And that's not going to be acceptable to the British people. Jewish people scared of going into central London. I know because they're friends of mine and friends of my daughter and they don't go anywhere near central London anymore because they are scared. When you see a cabinet minister, Michael Gove, mobbed for walking down the street, mobbed in a train station simply for being who he is by, by an Islamist group. And she says, this isn't acceptable, this is a hate mob, this cannot be allowed. To think that she is the problem and that she has stoked up the reaction of, yes, some football hooligans, yes, some far-right types, the Tommy Robinsons, yes, but also millions of ordinary, right-thinking, good people who just don't want our country to go down this route. And, and when, you, when you say when she, that she is the problem, when she is the person saying, the country, the house is on fire, and she shouts, fire, fire, to alert everybody and wants action taken. And you get rid of her, when you blame her, when you say she is the problem, but you ignore the arsonists, you're part of the problem. Rishi Sunak is now part of the problem. And what did they call her? The P word, populist. That's what they call her. They, they called her a lot populist. of other P words. And, but I hear the word populist, and what I hear is the fact that the Home Secretary was doing what the country yeah. wanted. Why is populist but, an insult? I consider it to be a compliment. But now we have the grown-ups, and what's the key criteria in a grown-up? They're prepared to listen and hear to what the British public want and say, no, 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 you don't know what you want. They listen to the technocrats, to big business, yeah. It's, this is, I'm afraid, a step backwards in time, and Rishi Sunak, Sad as it mm. take, pains me as it says this as a Conservative, I just believe has signed his own P45. Yeah. yeah. Who does he think this is going to appeal to? Does he, does he genuinely think that the Guardian Easters and the, and the BBC, or just, that they're all going to sign up to this? He is marching straight every day, closer and closer and closer to the executive lounge at Heathrow Airport, <laughs> where he's going to be off to California to be VC yeah. of a large tech fund. Yeah, I do, I do just think it's extraordinary. One of the other things I think is extraordinary from this weekend is looking at the footage. Now, again, I consume lots of different media. I look at tele, you know, TV shows across the spectrum, whether it's Channel 4, whether it's the BBC, whether it's you know, um, our channel, other, other rival channels. I, I consume you know, different newspapers. I, look at, I, have, I do not live in a social media bubble. I deliberately follow people that I know I disagree with on lots of things, to, and I learn more from that. And you know, I just think that most people in this country thought that two completely different events happened on Saturday. They thought there was a perfectly peaceful and nice pro-Palestinian march for people who wanted peace. And, and then there were a whole bunch of horrible thugs who were violent and who were stoked up by Swella Brubman. And that's, if you watch BBC Channel 4, that's what you think happened. If you consume other media, you see a lot on social media, you will, you will think, well, actually, you know, it was all just horrible violence on the pro-Palestinian, well, horrible anti-Semitic slurs and shouting and, and, and the like, and intimidatory behaviour. Um, and then there was this little scuffle near the cenotaph when the police kettled some, some right-wingers who, who wanted to come protect the cenotaph. Whereas actually, you know, both and neither are true at the same time. We now are in an American-style situation where half the country thinks the facts are this and half the country thinks the facts are this. You can't have a debate about the rights and wrongs of the facts if you don't even know what the facts are. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, what I saw was a media class that was intent, oh. come what may, to whip this up to get Suella. And look, I, I adore the, the press lobby, the political journalists in this country that uh, hold our politicians to account and, and keep the story going on. But what was clear to me was they were on a hunt. They smell blood. And over the weekend, they've gone off in the best pursuit of political journalists in this country, which is to get a scalp. Yeah. They've got one. Rishi Sunak has given in, but woe betide him, because he won't be the first Prime Minister to give in to the lobby that demands a yeah. scalp no, and exactly. then goes for you on the consequences yeah. of giving it them. Also, you've got a lobby by the who love Jeremy Hunt. Oh, they love Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, who is just literally the worst person to be the job. I'd like point out, actually, uh, it, is, it is fascinating, with David Cameron back in the government, 
um, extraordinary. This is a man who only a month ago <laughs> accused the Prime Minister of failing to act in Britain's long-term interest when he uh, uh, basically scrapped the northern leg of HS2. So there's already been big differences, but maybe in foreign policy they're more aligned. Anyway, well, lots... But hang on, China, his era, golden era, oh, very yeah. much looked on poorly now. Tory backbenchers won't like that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so, so much to talk about. Right, uh, don't forget, my question to you today is about the Prime Minister's decision to sack Home Secretary Swella Bradman. Was it the right decision? Tell us why you think it was. Tell you why you think it wasn't. Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. Text on 87222. You can tweet us on X at Talk TV. Dave has texted to say, my sacking Swella Bradman, Sunak has hammered the final nail into his Prime Ministerial coffin. Swella spoke for a good section of the public. Very much agreeing with you there, Sam. Mike says, the Prime Minister has no guts sacking Braverman and Nigel. I don't think it's Farage. I think he's he's just he's, he's already had his phone taken off him. Nigel sexted to say Suella was spot on with her comments. Time for a real government. Now, I'm also delighted to get the first call on air this morning. Alan has called in from Salford and he's on the line right now. Good morning to you, Alan. Good morning, Julia. Lovely to hear from you, yes, darling. What do you think of the decision, right or wrong? <laughs> Definitely wrong. I think it, it, well, he's just showing you what this suit like is. He's useless. He's weak. Uh, and I'm, he should call a general election now because I, I don't think he's going to do that, to, mate. <laughs> yes, but I want him to, to so see well I can get herself into into gear. I, I vote for her tomorrow for prime minister. Yeah, but, but she wouldn't. Yeah, but no, no. If he calls Sorry. a general election now, Tories are out on their ear. Best she can do is be uh, you know, opposition leader. Honestly, she doesn't have a constituency among Tory MPs. Her name will not go through to the party membership. Yes, but she doesn't. And forget this Parliament. I'm, I'm afraid I'm a Guido Fawkes man. This Parliament's a disgrace. And now the people. She speaks for the people. This woman, and it's a disgrace what's happened to her. Do you think it's just, uh, it is this extraordinary situation where everything the Prime Minister has said and done himself suggests he actually agrees with everything she said, that the Met were operating two-tier policing and that they, they should, the, Met, the march should have been banned? They're announcing legislation where they're going to be able to ban more extremist marches. So he's basically said she was right. Well, she was right, to be honest with you. You could see it was right. Most of the people in the country think she's right. But it seems that people in this country can't have a say now. Not even in Parliament, the I can see of it. Why, why do you uh, think he sacked her, then? Because of the calls from all this, you know, the left-wing left side and the media, I think so. It's a bizarre thing to do, isn't it? It's like, why does he, want to, why does he sack her because of, you know, what someone on the BBC says or, or what like, someone on the Labour front bench says? I mean... Well, this uh, is what's wrong with the country, isn't it? You know, it's, <laughs> it's all left-wing run media and, you know, even in his party he's got on there. So yeah, that, that's true. Cameron, Mr Cameron coming back, the old Remainer, you know, it, it, it's ridiculous. Uh, Alan, it's I think ridiculous. a lot of people will be agreeing with you. Alan and Salford there. Quick word from uh, Sam Armstrong. Yeah, Theresa May has just backed Cameron's move, uh, the architect, of course, of the net zero policies. I mean, just... Everybody you don't want to be happy with a move, what are they this morning? Yeah. Ecstatic. And they're all the people that got us into this mess in the first place. Deep size. So much more to talk about, guys. Don't go anywhere. Coming up after the break, we'll have more on the Prime Minister's decision to sack Smella Bradman as Home Secretary and David Cameron in as Foreign Secretary. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You'll be Talk TV on TV, on Radio Online, and on your smart speaker.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Don't forget, you can get in touch with me on all the socials at Talk TV or by text. Uh, send Talk plus your message to 8722. Or give me a call, 0344 499 1000. Today, I'm asking you very simply Prime Minister has sacked the Home Secretary, Suella Bravman. Do you agree? Was it the right call or not? Tell us why you think it was. Tell us why you think it wasn't. This comes after a week of speculation over Suella Bravman's position after she was accused of stoking tensions ahead of the Armistice Day protest, because, of course, it was all her fault, wasn't it? James Cleverley becomes the new Home Secretary. David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, is back taking up the role of Foreign Secretary. Uh, let's uh, just uh, come to some of these statements that have just been issued, actually, online uh, by those two men. Uh, James Cleverley moved from the Foreign Sec of Secretary job, where he's actually one of the most popular figures in the uh, party, among party members of the Conservatives. He's issued a statement uh, saying, uh, uh, it is an honour to be appointed as Home Secretary. The goal is clear. My job is to keep people in this country safe. I thought that was what um, Suella Braverman was trying to do when she spoke out about these horrible protests. Uh, meanwhile, a new Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, of course, who has to have a peerage now as a former MP for Whitney in Oxfordshire, he is a new Foreign Secretary. He said that while I may have disagreed with some individual decisions made by Rishi Sunak, I think a reference to, for instance, the, the, uh, the scrapping of HS2's northern leg, he is a strong and capable Prime Minister, he says, who is showing exemplary leadership at a difficult time. Well, Sam Armstrong uh, is a political commentator still in the studio with us right now, also joined by Tim Montgomery. He's founder of the Conservative Home website and a former special advisor to Boris Johnson. Tim Montgomery, good morning to you. What an exciting morning for us political junkies, Julia. Yes, absolutely. I, we had a lovely show all set up. We, were going to, we knew what we were going to be talking about all out the window, of course, <laughs> because we were talking about the reshuffle. First of all, are you surprised that the Home, Sec that the Home Secretary has been sacked? No, uh, not at all. And um, I think I differ with uh, what you and Sam have just been saying, Julia. I... I like a lot of what Suella says, just like I liked a lot of what Liz Truss said. But, you know, one thing Mrs Thatcher understood, which a lot of sort of people who purport to be Thatcherites today don't um, understand, is, is how hard government is. Anyone can say stuff, yeah. but actually using the Whitehall machine to deliver stuff is much harder. And well, particularly if, you, if your Whitehall machine you... is the Home Office, because it's virtually impossible to get well, them to do true. anything. Look, well, absolutely. And every, almost every other government in the world, Julia, has a home office in two separate units. They have a borders agency focusing on immigration issues, and then they have another department which looks at policing and terrorism. Yeah. Why, almost uniquely in the world, we have this mega department, which we know is dysfunctional, trying to do two unrelated things. You know, no wonder the department is a graveyard for ministerial careers. It, it wasn't fair on Suella, it hasn't been fair on other Home Secretaries to be given the job of running those two things. And particularly, you know, when someone hasn't been round the block, hasn't done a number of ministerial jobs, they just aren't experienced enough to do a job like that. And so it's partly also why I do welcome David Cameron's return. You know, when you have rookies in charge of departments like the Home Office, unable to get a grip of them, and you have some of your most experienced people on the scrap heap at 50 not used, you know, it's part of the reason why government doesn't work in this country anymore. Yeah, I mean, again, just because he's not Prime Minister anymore, people say well, he's, you know, he's, he's competent, he's managerial. There was a lot of praise, actually, at the time for David Cameron when he was Prime Minister. He, was, he ran, you know, he was very, very good at, you know, at, at delegating and, uh, and kept order. I mean, I have to say, having been a political journalist during the Tony Blair, Gordon Brown years, the TBGBs, the morning briefing calls against each side from number 10 to number 11, we just didn't see any of that when we had, certainly, the, uh, uh, the, the, the coalition years with the Lib Dems. It was kept, you know, very... I mean, sensible. I mean, people may not have agreed yeah. with a lot of things they did or some of the things they did, but they, they just got on with the job. That said, an awful lot of the things that we're grappling with right now is dealing with the problems that they introduced during that time. But let, let's talk about James Cleverley, because he's a very popular figure with uh, the uh, Conservative Party members, as polled by Con Home, which you, you, you're the founder of, um, representing ordinary grassroots Tories. Very popular figure. He's very, a very, very, very pleasant, friendly man. Um, and he's yeah. been seen to have done a very good job as foreign secretary. But we all know that really foreign affairs is run by 
number 10. It's not run by uh, the Foreign Secretary. We know that. He's been very popular. He's been put into the Home Secretary role. It is interesting that actually, I think in, in the modern era, Theresa May is the only Home Secretary to move directly from that job to number 10. And what a wonderful success she made of that move. Um, <laughs> it, that actually, it is usually the death of careers. Julia. Watch that for that one. <laughs> Yeah, well, no, but it's not normally very good for a political career because foreign office, you can sort of swan around and, you, and if there's a war, you get to sort of make rather sort of patriotic statements and you go and shake hands with important people. Home office, you're basically blamed everything, every time something goes wrong and something goes wrong pretty much every day. Yeah, and look, there's lots of talk about James Cleverley's future. If, as is expected, and I don't think anything that's happened today will change this, the Tories lose the next election, um, James Cleverley is favoured, probably favourite at the moment, to be the next Tory leader. But um, I don't know particularly why uh, um, Rishi Sunak has given James Cleverley this job, but perhaps it's to test him you know, in a really frontline job where it's policy choices are hard, where you really have to uh, be a skilled minister. You're, you're completely right about the foreign secretary job. It's perfect for David Cameron because... You know, he, he'll, be, he'll play the part very well of representing Britain on the world stage. But policy is created in number 10 by the Prime Minister. Mm. Big decisions are taken by heads of government meeting at summits, talking directly to each other. The Foreign Secretary does the preparatory stuff, but they don't actually take any big decisions. No. And so what we get now with James Cleverley at the Home Office is, can he relate to the public on some of the stuff you've been talking about this morning? Is he going to re retain the strong line that... Suella Brubman rightly had, but back it up with policy detail. And will he survive all the, 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 the mess-ups that come out of that extraordinarily dysfunctional yeah. I, I think if you're Rishi Sunak... How will he, hand, how listen, will he handle them? Don't think about it. I think if you're Rishi Sunak and you're way down in the polls in terms of popularity among Tory party members, and we've got James Cleverley at the top, what better cunning weeds of a move is it to put James Cleverley into the, 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 that job where you're actually going to basically cause him uh, some damage, I would have thought. But look, let's come back to the decision to sack Home Secretary Suella Bravman. Because to, for the Prime Minister to have called in Sir Mark Rowley, the Met Chief, last week and say, you know, for an hour, call, made him cancel in a speech he was making, to call him in to basically say, I think you should cancel this, you know, ban this march, mm. I think there's going to be trouble. For him to, um, say, announce today from number 10 that there are going to be new laws to try and protect the streets of Britain from extremist marches. I mean, he's basically admitting that Suella Braverman was right. And he's giving in to the likes of Labour Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting, who says Suella entirely to, was entirely to blame for the events on Saturday with the, you know, the, the extreme right-wingers, the football hooligans and the, some of the scuffles they got into. Um, pouring petrol on the flames, he said. The idea that those men, they were largely men, uh, were, were going to sit at home drinking cups of tea on Saturday and not go to, uh, to Whitehall, to the Cenotaph, um, is, is, is for the birds, isn't it? Hasn't he just admitted that she was right and he sacked his Home Secretary for telling the truth? Look, I, I, think, I think Labour are getting away with murder at the moment, Julia. The, the fact is that Labour have a big problem with their Muslim vote. They, you know, let, let's be absolutely direct about it. Uh, Keir Starmer's really upset an incredibly important Labour constituency and this is an opportunity for him to reconnect with that Muslim vote by kicking the Tories hard on what you know the Palestinian issue. So if anyone is playing politics with this issue, it's the Labour Party. And you wouldn't know that from the BBC. Labour get away with it scotch free, and it, you know, it, it's, it's a disgrace. Um, but look, I, I, I largely agree with you. I don't quite know why Suella Braverman was sacked, but only because her offences have been multiple, really. You know, I actually thought her remarks about the homeless last week, that it was somehow a lifestyle choice. That was a, Sort of thing you'd expect from Alan Bastard, you know, the, the comedian of the 1980s. Except she was sort talking about San Francisco joke. and Los Angeles. As always, everything she says... I mean, again, <laughs> I don't think she should have said these words because she, she should predict the, the outcry. Well, but, yeah, but well, she, she, a, a, a she said we don't want to go, go down the same route as San Francisco and Los Angeles where some of the rough sleeping is a lifestyle choice. That's what she said. Yeah, but a skilled politician, if you were advising her, Julia... Yeah, she wouldn't just, say just, it. You would have told... You told her not to do it. And, yep. you know, when you're a government in trouble, you can't have yep. the government's message constantly sort of knocked off course by a Home Secretary who's not 
yep. skilled enough at the, in the media. No, I, I agree with you on I that. We've, been, we've been very critical of her for that as well. She's, she's her own worst enemy in that sense. Tim Montgomery, founder of Conservative Home. So appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much indeed. If you are watching, actually, on the screen, we'll see we've got footage of a, a Suella Bravman attending you know, Armistice Day events. We've also got live shots of number 10 Downing Street. Who's going in? Who's going out? Also now got uh, Sam Armstrong, uh, political commentator. He's still with me in the studio on the screen. Before we go to another caller, um, it is interesting, this, you know, uh, David Cameron backing, you know, there's no doubt at all, Cleverly will be really unhappy about this move. It, it, and he knows perfectly well this will, this will damage his career. Um, but David Cameron back, uh, it, does this tell us, you know, Swella Bravman out, David Cameron back, that this is just a return to the old guard, same old, same old? Well, remember, Rishi Sunak has not got much road left to run. He had his last King's speech, Mm -hmm. Not much in there. I mean, we could barely come up with anything to talk about when it was on. We had it on live and then we were literally struggling. What do we talk about? And if that was thin on the ground, we've got the autumn statement next week. Is there going to be a tax cut? Well, it ain't going to be a big one. Nothing to move it's, the dial. And again, it's, sorry, it's a tax cut. What people are thinking... Any tax cut they give isn't going to make a blind bit of difference to how much poorer people are and how they feel. Well, he's got no more conference speeches left, so he's got this reshuffle. And what is this reshuffle sh showing? And bear in mind, this is the guy who said, I'm going to bring change after yeah. 13 years in government. And what does he do to show he's going to bring change? Well, he's going to bring in the guy that ran the country for the first six years of it. And just when there was some actual big change in this country, Brexit, what did he do? Ran off in protest, went and lobbied for an Australian bank that all went a bit Pete Tong. Yeah. All those scandals still. To an awful lot of what's come out about what David Cameron's doing in terms of lobbying, especially during, um, during the early months of COVID, really quit, pretty shocking. He does not come out very well of it. If I worked for The Guardian or BBC or, or The Mirror right now, I would be looking up those cuttings. Uh, anyway, more from Sam Armstrong throughout the show. Your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast this morning with your reaction to the PM's decision to sack Suella Bravman as Home Secretary. Was it the right call? Tell us why it was, tell us why it wasn't. Carl has texted to say, thank you, Vishy Sunak. You've made my decision easy for the next general election. Hmm. I, I, I want to know what the follow-up is to that. Susan says, I have never been so angry. Suella has her faults, but she is honest about her problems. Why don't we march to get rid of these awful politicians? And Mick says, at this rate, Emmanuel Macron will be the deputy prime minister in Richie's reshuffle. Good God, man, don't give him ideas. What a... What earth are you thinking? Meanwhile, uh, Paul has called in from Burnley and is on the line. Good morning to you, Paul. Morning, Julia. I'm, uh, I'm ringing from the heart of the uh, Red Wall. 80% yep. um, roughly voted uh, leave in the referendum and subsequently, uh, for the first time in over 100 years, Burnley voted for a Conservative MP. Um, when they look at what's happened today... I think there are going to be two winners from this decision. Mm. The first will be short term, and that will be Keir Starmer will walk into number 10 Downing Street. But after five years of reversing Brexit, after five years of mass immigration on steroids, after five years of LGBTQ pronouns and critical race theory obsession, people will finally realise that the Labour Party was a working class party and it's become an Islington dinner party. We will then see that Sunak has capitulated to the dwellers of the metropolitan London borough of Ivory Towers, and we're going to have a back-to-the-future moment. We've already had it with Cameron coming back, and we're going to see a, a return of what was UKIP in, in the form of Reform UK, and that will be the other winner. There'll be two winners, Starmer yep. and Reform UK. I agree with every single word of that, Paul, every single word. I do not understand who Rishi Sunak thinks he's appealing to. It's this desperate need to have the Guardian editorial writers and the BBC political editors, you know, agree with him. They're never going to agree with him. Why does it matter? It, uh, it, it be, it's beyond me. It, it, it's almost as if there is a, a Westminster Uni party and it's just simply a relay race when one, one of the parties... That are, you can't get a fag paper between the two of them, yeah. it's simply handing over the baton. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Paul. Thank you very much. Sam Armstrong, uh, your response to that? Uh, well, if the Red Wall thinks that today, and th having had no push, who knows what it's going to think in the weeks to come. This is a government that's meant to be focus grouping, polling, working out what the country thinks. Uh, it seems to know an awful lot more about what Westminster thinks than it does about Wigan. It, it really does. Um, it, I... <sighs> 
I, it's genuinely painful this morning. It's genuinely painful to watch them doing this. This is, this is a suicide mission, to all intents and purposes. Westminster sources have said over the past few weeks that the Downing Street Corps has gone into a bunker, started talking yep. and listening only to themselves. This feels, looks, smells to me like the kind of crazy crackpot idea you come up with yep. when you've had nobody else giving you any feedback whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, deep size, everyone. Coming up after the break, more on the breaking news this morning that the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has sacked Suella Brahman as Home Secretary. James Cleverley has moved from the Foreign Office to the Home Office. And David Cameron, the former PM, is back as Foreign Secretary. Extraordinary morning. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You'll be talking TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. Do you know what I love about Tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? <laughs> I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous... What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I am Sanz. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's That's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you and we're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after this <laughs> <film. laughs> right. film. Uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yes. King Piers and King Cube. I think <laughs> it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going going. To, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Well, the big news today is that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has sacked his Home Secretary, Swella Bradman, as part of a major cabinet reshuffle. James Cleverley has moved from the Foreign Office to become the new Home Secretary. And guess who's back? David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, is the new Foreign Secretary. As Lord Cameron, of course, no longer an MP. Well, discussing all of this with us today, former political editor of The Sun, now political columnist, Trevor Kavanagh joins me now. Good morning to you. Good morning, Julia. Well, I mean, this is, come on, we're, we're all political hacks. This is our, our meat and two potatoes, bread and butter, all rolled into one. What an extraordinary morning. First question. Why do you think Vishy Sunak sacked Suella Bravman? Well, I think in the end, if you look at it logically, he had no choice simply because she defied him by writing an article in the Times which used language which he 
specifically asked her not to use. The problem with that is that uh, he has now upset a very large proportion of rank and file Tory voters who agree with every single word that Suella wrote on that day. So he was in a very, very difficult position. Uh, there she was, really, I mean, uh, there's no two ways about this. She is angling for the succession as and when the Tories uh, crash to defeat at the next election, which is now not just a possibility, it's now nailed in, nailed yeah, on. An, in an inevitability. So, but so, so because this article definitely. in The Times, and we talked about it, it's an awful lot at the end of last <laughs> week, um, because you know, she had submitted it to The Times, they said make some changes, um, as I think her advisers should have done, um, as the remarks about the comparison with Northern Ireland. I think it was unnecessary to use the phrase hate march. I think you could be very critical of many of the people on those marches without using those terms, and we I was criticised that on the show. Um, but, but they didn't make the changes. That is just sort of insubordination, and you, and you get sacked for that. Except... He didn't sack her immediately. He waited for the march to happen. She was proven right. Everything that happened on Saturday was exactly as she has predicted it would be. He has said that he's going... His office has said he's going to be bringing in new laws to actually adjust, you know, to change the, the rights to protest and from extremists and the like. So he's basically admitted what she said was correct. And now he's sacked her. Yes, I think that um, you have to make an allowance for the fact that uh, Suella Braverman was a very outspoken politician, but she was also Home Secretary and under an obligation to use nuanced language. We might agree with every word she said, but she was asked not to use it, and you and I as journalists know that if the editor says no, then you risk having to go if you, if you refuse. So, I mean, I think that particular point is a narrow one. What has emerged from this reshuffle, though, is a total disaster. The appointment of David Cameron completely eclipses Suella Braverman's uh, sacking because what you've got here is the man who blundered through Brexit, upsetting just about everybody in the Conservative Party in the process, dividing the nation from top to bottom, perhaps forever, suddenly being reappointed to the job as Foreign Secretary in charge of the very negotiations which are still ongoing between Britain and Europe over Brexit, to, to name just one big issue. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is an extraordinary bit of news. Now, we know David Cameron had been, he's in his early 50s or mid 50s. He, he's talked about how he, uh, you know, he kind of pondered a possible, you know, move back to government. He's obviously a bit bored. Uh, he went off to, you know, make even more money. He was already a rich man, he became a rich man even more. And now, he, you know, obviously, having money, it turns out, is a bit boring. I'm, I'm sure he'll be a very competent foreign secretary, but the signal this sends is there's, there's really no one good on the benches coming up. I don't trust any of these people. I need, I need the, you know, the old guard to come back and help. And yet so many people who voted Conservative in 2019, they voted for Conservative because people like David Cameron were no longer at the heart of that party. You're absolutely right on this issue, Julia. I think that an awful lot of people within the Conservative Party on the back benches and on the front benches and serving as members of David Cameron's cabinet will be absolutely infuriated that he couldn't find anyone among them to take on this important role. Nobody apparently is up to that job except for a man who basically failed in the job of being prime minister and had to resign because he made the terrible mistake, A, of calling a referendum, and be of losing it. Oh, I disagree and with you. I disagree with you. He 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 did a good thing by calling. He promised us a referendum. He didn't. He was hoping he wouldn't have to deliver it. He then gave us the referendum. We had it. I didn't like the campaign he and Osborne mounted for Remain, but and he said he wasn't going to resign. So I think that was unreasonable of him. But but I don't I don't think it was a complete failure. The government. I just think he's he's yesterday's man. Well, I think it was a failure in the sense that he didn't go in and bat and win the case that he wanted to get from the European Union. He gave up, he allowed them to just treat him like dirt and had no case to put to the British people when this referendum was carried. And as a result, we have a, a division in the, uh, in the British nation which is going to take a very long time to heal. I, like you, I'm very pleased that we had the chance to vote and that we voted to leave. But on the political front, if you assess it as an act of political skills and deafness, it was a disaster for uh, both Cameron and for the Conservative Party and for the country, because he lost it. OK, just finally, one word answer. Has this reshuffle uh, that we know about so far, these big offices of state moving, has this made Rishi Sunak stronger or weaker? Weaker. Weaker, and I think we are now 
I think I've given up hope of any chance of the Tories winning next time. Trevor Kavanagh, always good to get your analysis. I mean this very politely. Been around a long time, knows his stuff. Uh, Trevor Kavanagh from The Sun. Uh, let's come back to Sam Armstrong. Just a brief word from you. Trevor said it right. In, in fact, I seriously question whether Rishi Sunak could, could, and it's, it's speculative, not even make it to the next election. I think there will be a lot of backbenchers unhappy and the closer and closer and closer we get to an election mm. with Tory MPs looking at those polls and seeing themselves yeah. 25 yeah. points down, Turkeys don't vote for Christmas. And not, and not being able to pay the mortgage. I mean, this is about, you know, this is about not being able to, uh, you know, put, put roof over your head, isn't it? And more from Sam Armstrong. Coming up after the uh, news at the break, uh, Rishi Snack has sacked Smela Brahman as Home Secretary. More on the pro-Palestinian marches as the Prime Minister seeks to clamp down on protests. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Don't go away. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning, welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You'll be Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Goodness me, uh, live breaking news all this morning. The Prime Minister has sacked the Home Secretary, Swella Brabman, with a wider cabinet reshuffle taking place right now. James Cleverly has moved from the Foreign Office to take up the role as Home Secretary, while David Cameron, yes, that David Cameron, former Prime Minister, is now the new Foreign Secretary. This comes after a week of speculation over Swella 
rather than his position after she was accused of stoking tensions ahead of the Armistice Day protest, even though, of course, she was entirely right about everything she said. A total of 145 people were arrested on Saturday during the pro-Palestinian march and far-right counter-protests. One question to you today is about the PM's decision to sack Suella Bravman. Was it the right decision and why? Also love to know, do you think it makes him weaker or stronger? Uh, do get in touch. You can give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text on 8722 or you can tweet us on X at Talk TV. First though, let's get the latest news headlines with Amelie Rose Adams. Good morning. Former Prime Minister David Cameron has been appointed as the new Foreign Secretary as Rishi Sunak reshuffles his cabinet. He's no longer an elected politician, having stood down as an MP in 2016. Well, Labour has said Mr Cameron's appointment puts to bed the PM's laughable claim to offer change. And The Sun's columnist Rod Liddell told us he thinks it's a disastrous decision. It's remarkable that they should think that the public would be sort of gasping for another bit of David Cameron, uh, because we haven't had enough in the past. Remarkable. Uh, and it means that there'll be kind of outright civil war within the Conservative Party. It's probably the worst thing he could possibly have done. Well, David Cameron's replacing James Cleverley, who's been appointed as the new Home Secretary. Suella Braverman was sacked from her role by the Prime Minister over accusations she stoked tensions at this weekend's protests in London. In response, she says, It's been the greatest privilege of my life to serve as Home Secretary, and I will have more to say in due course. Well, our correspondent Oliver Whitfield Mircic is live at Downing Street and has the latest for us. Well, apart from that huge news that the uh, Home Secretary was sacked this morning. There's been three other ministers who have gone. Nick Gibb as a schools minister, Will Quince as a health minister and Neil O'Brien as a levelling up minister. As far as the departures and arrivals here on Downing Street, we've seen Therese Coffey go into number 10 within the past hour. We believe she's still in there. Big questions though about whether she will keep her job as the Environment Secretary or just how wide ranging this reshuffle is going to be. Thank you very much, Oliver. In other news now, five people have died and one person is missing after a devastating house fire in West London. Police say those who died are all believed to be members of the same family. Around 70 firefighters battled the blaze overnight as it tore through a property in Hounslow. The father of Indy Gregory says he's angry after the eight-month-old at the centre of a legal battle died following the withdrawal of her life support treatment. Indy's parents wanted specialists to keep treating her rare condition that affected how her body used energy. Doctors went to the courts to stop treatment, saying she was in too much pain and distress. The Royal Mail has been fined £5.6 million for failing to deliver post on time in what the regulators called a wake-up call for the organisation. It's supposed to deliver more than 90% of first and second class letters within one and three days, but actual times fell well below this. And around 100,000 homes and businesses are without power in Ireland as Storm Debbie makes landfall. Flooding is also expected in parts of Northern Ireland, and we're being expected to warn, uh, we're being warned to expect rather severe and damaging weather in the UK with more heavy rain and strong winds on the way. Well, that's the latest. Now time for a closer look at today's weather. More on Storm Debbie with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. It's going to be uh, very wet this afternoon, incredibly windy for some areas as well, thanks to Storm Debbie. The Met Office do have warnings in force for much of uh, northern England and the northwest of Wales. An amber warning for the northwest of England, where the strongest winds are likely gust up to 80 miles per hour. It's also looking very wet with spells of rain that will be heavy at times across Scotland and northern England. Becoming a bit drier compared to this morning, though, for the rest of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. But there will be blustery showers, especially to the west of these areas. Now, overnight, Storm Debbie eventually pulls off into the North Sea, as you can see, so it does become calmer with clear spells developing, but there will be plenty of blustery showers around, particularly down towards the southwest. I think there may be some merging to longer spells of rain there by the early hours of the morning for southwest to England. It will be a mild night, though. And then through tomorrow, we'll see the uh, blustery showers continue. It won't be as windy as today, but some downpours could be quite heavy and thundery, especially down towards the southwest and across many southern counties of England and Wales. There could be some really hefty downpours during the the morning clearing by the afternoon though elsewhere we will see showers particularly across the north of the UK
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. Welcome back to a very busy show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. More in this hour on the breaking news this morning that the Prime Minister has, as many had expected, sacked the Home Secretary, Suella Bravman. James Cleverley has moved from the Foreign Office to take up the role as Home Secretary. Meanwhile, he's been replaced by none other than former Prime Minister David, now Lord Cameron. Extraordinary, extraordinary morning. Well, today we are asking you about Home Secretary sacking. Was it the right decision by the Prime Minister? Do you think it makes him weaker? Do you think it makes him stronger? Why did he do it, given that he's basically sacked someone for being right about the protests at the weekend? Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text on 8722 or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Love to get more of your calls on air and more of your messages too. Joining me to run through all of the top stories this morning is commentator Sam Armstrong. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Before we get to him though, let's get an update on the latest big political news from our chief political commentator, Peter Cardwell. Good morning to you once again, Peter. Extraordinary morning. People who are just tuning in or, I don't know, God forbid, waking up. I want that job, getting up that late. Um, what has been going on? It's an, an unbelievable morning. Extraordinary is the word I would use, and you have correctly used it. David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, back as, as uh, Foreign Secretary. That's the first time, I think, since uh, under Heath, of course, seven years after being Prime Minister Alec Douglas Hume became uh, Foreign Secretary for him. Sula Braverman is out as well. That is a dramatic sacking. And Rishi Sunak clearly trying to move back to the centre ground where he thinks elections are won and lost in this country. And certainly with James Cleverley moving to uh, be Home Secretary, replacing uh, Suella Braverman, a few more junior ministers going, uh, people like Neil O'Brien, Will Quince and Nick Gibb. So really, this is the start. Therese Coffey is still in Downing Street and there's a lot happening today. Absolutely. It is extraordinary. I mean, <clears throat> well, we, we know there's often a, 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 a little dance, set of dance steps that happen when you've got uh, a reshuffle and actually someone walking through the front door of Number 10, walking past those massive phalanx of cameras and people shouting, what's your new job, you know, David? Uh, that, that they have got a guaranteed job. David, no way in the world David Cameron uh, walked up Downing Street without full knowledge of what job he was going to be given. And often, the people who are being sacked, well, they enter through a door round the back uh, and they're not seen until we find out that they've been sacked. A lot of people will be sitting by their phones waiting right now, waiting for that phone call. What I want to know is, what does this tell us? You say this is like Rishi Sunak saying, well, you know, this is, this is the centre ground is where you want to be. Um, the reality is, you know, Keir Starmer is occupying that ground right now. You can enter the centre ground and try and take some of those votes. But at the same time, surely Rishi Sunak is risking dropping all the voters on... Well, again, we say the right of the party. I don't know anyone on the left or the right of the Conservative Party or any of any political party who's sensible and right-thinking, who thinks that what's been going on in our streets in the last five weeks on Saturday afternoons in, in London has been acceptable or, or, or something that we should allow in terms of some of the disgusting anti-Semitic slogans and chanting and behaviour and intimidation. Um, it, it seems to me that he has completely misread this. And look at where Reform UK are in the polls, for example, doing a lot better than they have previously, perhaps not breaking through at the election, but clearly there are major, major problems for Rishi Sunak. He's called himself the change candidate. If you ask people, do you want change? About 80% of people say yes. But of course, uh, Keir Starmer is not at 80% in the polls. He's much lower, although still about 19 points, uh, percentage points ahead of Rishi Sunak. But the question some people are asking is, is this really changed to bring back the old guy, bring back the guy who used to be Prime Minister a while ago? That's been welcomed by Theresa May, for example. That's been welcomed by various people in the Conservative Party who want to move it back to the centre ground. But whether that is the right political strategy for Rishi Sunak is a big question. And whether it's actually a bit of a desperate move to say what is a radical, outside-the-box kind of way yeah. of doing a reshuffle that can be done, because this is dramatic stuff. Also getting rid of Suella Braverman, look, whatever he did with her, whether he demoted her, whether he, or which I expect, expect she wouldn't have accepted, whether he sacked her or whether she resigned, uh, that was something that was always going to be difficult for Rishi Sunak because of the political machinations in the last few days. 
In terms of Ciela Bravman now, she is off the leash. Any control at all, not that there was a lot of it, but any control at all Downing Street had on her. She can say whatever she likes. Yep. She doesn't have the uh, responsibility of running the Home Office, the, the huge amount of time that that takes as well. She is a big political figure. She's going to become a bigger political figure. And if, as expected, Rishi Sunak loses the next election, well, I think I would bet quite a lot of money that she will be the favourite to be the next leader oh, of the Conservative well, I mean, Party. the favourite among party members, but this thing many people were saying last week, we discussed it on the show, whether was she manoeuvring to try and get herself sacked? As you yeah. say you know, mm -hmm. earlier, you, you, someone writes, you write an article for the Times newspaper, you submit it to number 10 uh, about these protests upcoming, it's already a big political debate, and then they say, well, you need to change this, this and this. We know which bits they've said, don't say hate marchers and, and don't make comparisons with Northern Ireland. And you don't make those changes. I mean, that's gross misconduct. That, that's exactly offence but she wasn't sacked until today and a lot of people are going to be questioning that bearing in mind this week in, in two days time we're going to get the supreme court decision on the rwanda asylum policy that's going to be huge news now i, I would argue actually it's a win-win for the government they win the policy they can go ahead with it they lose the policy well it's the unelected judges who are stopping the government of the day doing the job which the british public wants so i think it, it's to a certain extent they can play that either way if they want but the key thing about this is a reshuffle like this, sacking the person who, as I was saying earlier, when your house is on fire and the person shouts, there's a fire, there's a fire, everybody. Don't, don't blame the person doing that. Blame the person who set your house on fire in the first place. It seems to me that this reshuffle is, it's just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And to continue the thought in terms of the Supreme Court, were it to go against the government, Sula Braverman, I would imagine, let's say she was still Home Secretary, hypothetically, yeah. she would say, right, now's the time to leave the ECHR, uh, European yeah. Court of Human Rights, uh, European Convention of Human Rights. Now's the time, got to go, Rwanda has to go ahead, flagship policy of the government, which she said she dreamt of flights taking off for Rwanda. Rishi Sunak then doesn't do that, then she can resign and say this is the issue. So a lot of this is what if, what could happen, manoeuvring, yeah. the chess, the three-dimensional chess game of any reshuffle. There was no right thing for Rishi Sunak to do. Some people say, like, keeping Sula Bradman there, lots of people very uh, much a fan of hers. The question as well, in terms of a leadership, is whether she gets to the final round because of where how things work in a Conservative leadership election. You've got to get the MPs to get you to the final two. Does she get to the final two? But if she got to the final two, I was at Conservative Party conference a month ago. There was great love for Sula Bradman amongst the, uh, amongst yeah. the membership. And, and many say okay, she won't because she hasn't got the support among the MPs. But to be fair, everyone said that about Boris Johnson as well back in 2019. Absolutely, Julia, they? absolutely. Um, and who would make any uh, kind of predictions, certainly given what has <laughs> happened with him and in the last few, few, few years in politics in this country? So, I, I, look, she is incredibly popular amongst the Conservative membership. She speaks their language. And I think that she yeah. will continue to be a major political figure in the weeks, months and possibly years to come. Absolutely. Really interesting to talk to you. Thank you very much, our chief political commentator there, Peter Carwell. Let's go back to Sam Armstrong, commentator, joining us in the studio. Um, it's interesting, Peter Carwell mentioned Reform UK, uh, Richard Tyson's party, and, and you know, doing, doing a bit better in the polls. But again, it's still at a low level. But we're back in the territory of, say, UKIP, and the Brexit party. Remember, you know, the reason there was the promise of a Brexit referendum by David Cameron wasn't because he wanted to have a referendum. He's a technocrat. He doesn't think that people should have a say. We know that. Um, uh, it was because the threat from UKIP. And Reform UK don't need to win a single seat, not a single councillor, not a single MP. All they need to do is to win enough support to stop Tories from winning. And they are in place in a number of key seats to do that. They will absolutely do that. Uh, if Rishi Sunak genuinely believes that the way ahead to electoral victory is to try and win back all of these defectors to the Liberal Democrats, to try and go <laughs> after laughable. seats like Putney that they've lost. He is mad. But is it any surprise they're going back? Look at who's been got rid of in scandals of late. Dominic Raab, Priti Patel, Suella Braverman, Boris Johnson. I mean, can anybody see a pattern? Every senior Brexiteer in government one or other scandal has come along that's yep. got rid of them, all of which seem to be engineered by those around. There's civil kind of servants. Backside, civil servants. And who has replaced them? Well, we now have great officers of state, four out of four private school boys. And there will be people wondering if Nadine Dorries maybe had a little bit of a point. Is there an establishment coup going on to replace yep. those the that lean <sighs> against 
what the stuff I am want. never a conspiracy theorist, mainly because I've met a lot of these people and I don't think they're clever enough to ever mount a conspiracy, whether that's about, you know, the COVID and the jabs and the these nets. Genuinely, they're all just they're all just egotists, careerists, uh, and just and just don't bother reading their briefs. I mean, honestly, there is there is the cock up explanation is always much more accurate than the conspiracy explanation. But there is no doubt at all that this is a punch in the face. Let's just use it. This is a punch in the face for the right of the party, for the Brexiteers. Um, I spoke to a senior Tory uh, a little bit earlier before coming on the show who, who was from a red wall seat, a very senior figure who, who said they can't come on the show. Uh, they said, he said, um, uh, and, but he said, you can quote me. He said, I'm beeped off. And an awful lot of people will be beeped off. Um, and again, a lot of ordinary party members. But as Peter Carbell touched on, um, Suella so Bradman definitely has designs. She has her eyes set on the top prize. Well, the top prize of being, you know, shadow opposition, you know, opposition leader, not, not Tory prime minister, because she'd only get that job realistically if the Tories had been ousted. But she may have a lot of support among the party faithful, the party membership. She does not have a lot of support, well, certainly on the left of the Conservative Party in Parliament, the MPs, but actually not much on the right. A number of those peak figures on the right, you'd expect to be big fans of hers, or not. They say she doesn't do the work, she doesn't follow her brief, that she puts her foot in it and she undermines their case. So she doesn't have quite the same support in Parliament that many people might expect her to have. Look, I've worked with the Tory right for quite a long time. I'll put it this way. They're a, they're a prickly bunch of, of, of often chaps that, that have got their own views about their own suitability <laughs> for the top right. But oh, at point. the relevant moment, they will coalesce around the key candidate. Here's the point, though. The direction that Rishi Sunak is taking the party means all those red wall MPs, and there are 60, 70, 80 of those reasonably called that, yeah. they will likely be leaving Parliament if he continues yeah. down this path at the next election. Yeah. Which means the new group of MPs selecting, shortlisting candidates to be Tory leader will be even more left-wing, even more yep. out of touch with the 2019 vote of Conservative yep. uh, voters than they are now. That's going to have an interesting dynamic as to how far the right of the party can go in selecting the leader they might really yes, want. Indeed. And that's the fascinating thing in terms of which seats, as you say, which seats are left if there is a mass destruction of the party. Let me come back, though, to some of the um, uh, statements that have may been made by new appointees today. The new Foreign Secretary, Lord... Cameron, as he is now, David Cameron, he had to call, not a, mem not a member of parliament anymore, has now become a member of the House of Lords, appointed a, a barony. Um, I think his wife was entitled to something anyway. They're, they're, they're very posh. They're very posh, posh. Um, he said that while I may have disagreed with some individual decisions made by Rishi Sunak, of course, he publicly criticised him over the scrapping of the HS2 Northern leg only a month ago. Uh, Lord Cameron says he is a strong and capable prime minister who is showing exemplary leadership at a difficult time. Um, uh, we also um, had uh, statements from uh, the new F Home Secretary, as was Foreign Secretary J James Cleverly, uh, saying that uh, uh, how proud he is to take on the role uh, as, uh, as Home Secretary. Of course, we've also had Theresa May congratulating David Cameron on his return to government. Um, I'm, I'm oh, also, by the way, congratulations from the former Health Secretary, Matt Hancock. I'm not sure those are two people, two utterly failed and exposed individuals who totally failed this country, um, giving congratulations. If they're happy, I'm not sure a lot of other people will be. All the wrong people backing this move this yep. morning. All people, by the way, uh, Theresa May, David Cameron, struggled with the whole election winning business. Uh, and there will be many David people... Cameron won a majority. <laughs> to be fair, Theresa May, this is a little known fact, Theresa May actually put on three percentage points in terms of Tory support in 2017. The, the Mind you, she was up against Corbyn, for God's sake. The winner's the one that comes home with 330 with, yeah. MPs. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do it. David Cameron, first time around, couldn't do it. Yeah. Won very successfully, but a narrow victory in, in 2015 by promising, what did he promise? An EU referendum. Yeah. Didn't like the results. Seriously, 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 you yeah. will have Tory MPs today in seats in the north of England that are brushing up their CVs absolutely, as we speak. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, the general rule is when the Prime Minister makes a decision, who is happy about it? It's often a giveaway whether it's a good decision or not. I just, I just think this makes him look incredibly weak. It's going backwards. 
an awful lot of the things that the governments right now are grappling with, government ministers grappling with, are actually things that were done under David Cameron's premiership and George Osborne's um, uh, chancellorship. I do find it extraordinary that um, uh, Ed Balls and George Osborne, they've got some apparently, you know, massive podcast. I mean, and they're always on TV shows talking, giving their tuppence worth. I mean, again, two people who, who were living with the fallout of some of their terrible decision-making. And people used to say, oh, there's nothing between them. They're just faking anger. And mm. Tory and Labour, they're all the same. Well, they were kind of proved right when yeah. six years on, they went and set up a podcast together. But yeah. this is what Rishi Sunak is trying to do. He is trying to bring himself closer to where the Labour Party is, the centre, centre-right, yeah. that's what they say. Keir Starmer taking it closer to the centre. And yeah. there are many people that say, it doesn't matter who wins or loses an election. The same, same people are running our country. And I feel they are <laughs> they're getting a lot of that right right now. They really, really are. Well, I'm asking you today, the Prime Minister sacked Home Secretary uh, Suella Braverman. Was it the right decision? Tell us why it was. Tell us why it wasn't. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Also, whether or not you think this makes him weaker or whether you think this makes the Prime Minister uh, stronger as well. Um, let's go to some of the texts and tweets that are coming in. Um, I'm just trying to get to some of those right now. Um, Adrian has texted to say, Sunak has come completely doomed the Tories. Suella tells the truth, but was dialed into the silent majority. Like Boris, she united both Labour and Tory voters. Steve says, RIP the Conservatives, 1824 to 2023. And Carl says it's time for a referendum, a vote of no confidence in the two main parties, and end first past the post voting. The country is Broken. Well, keep your responses coming in. You can text on 87222, tweet us on X at Talk TV, or give us a call on 0344 499 1000. Jackie from Manchester has done just that, and she is on the line right now. Good morning to you, Jackie. Good morning, Julia. Thanks for calling in. What do you want to say? Do you think uh, the Prime Minister did the right thing or not? No, I think it's... Well, I think it's... it's... It's great for left-leaning people um, that she's out of the way. Um, but for the British public, I think it's a disaster. And I would have to concur with Sam. It does feel as though we're under a left-wing coup at the moment because Labour, Labour might not be in office, but it certainly <laughs> feels like the left are in power. Um, yes. And it's contrary to what the British people voted for. Yes. And I think it has serious implications. And I think it's dangerous times for representative, representative democracy because democratic processes we know have been bypassed. We, we had it with Brexit. We've had it with the net zero. Um, we've had it when we voted for immigration. And I think the... People are so fed up. The trust in politics is yeah. so low um, that, you know, we ha it is a uniparty. We, we haven't got choice. Democracy seems like an illusion in this country. Yeah, I think now. a lot of people feel that. I think I mean, what happened post the 2016 referendum, I, I, was, I was genuinely shocked by how many people just didn't actually, you know, by the way, including Keir Starmer, the man who wants to be our next Prime Minister, who just totally dismissed the vote of, uh, of uh, all, all those 17 million plus voters and, and basically tried to undermine it because they knew better than us. I find that I, I, still quite shocking. And I think genuinely that makes him unfit for public office. I think those are giveaways that people are, are not safe to, to be in number 10. But this is the thing, we've had 13 years of various different, I mean, goodness knows how many different prime ministers uh, in the last few years, um, telling us you know, it's a Conservative government. And, and yet, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of that whatsoever. As you say, with net zero, the madness going on in our schools on, you know, on gender ideology and, and, and all of these other policies, there just doesn't seem to be any me tax rises, you know, it doesn't, immigration at sky high levels. In no way is this a Conservative government, as as most people would understand it. And they've stood by while our institutions yeah. have been infected with this leftist ideology. You know, the police, the NHS, even in our schools, as you said. And, it, it, you know, w w we seriously need to wake up to this because it's ripping society apart, what is going on. And we, we, we're rudder rudderless. We've got, they've given up governing, governing. Um, we've got no leadership and I just think it, it, it is a dangerous time for politics in this country. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people will agree with you. Jackie, thank you so much indeed for that. She's called in from Manchester. Um, Sam Armstrong, um, 
I think a lot of people feel this way. I don't think this is, I don't think this is sort of scaremongering. I think people genuinely do feel like it doesn't matter who we vote for, they keep telling us we're wrong and they're going to do what they're going to darn well do anyway. Oh, but hang on, Julia. Lord Heseltine, Matt Hancock, George Osborne have all said this morning this is a great reshuffle. Everyone's really happy. Don't, don't you worry about those people out there in the red wall. Don't worry about them. The serious, the grown-ups, they're The grown-ups. They've worked it all out. They've, they're just smarter than us, OK? okay they understand yeah. what this country wants is more expensive electricity bills. What it wants is higher taxes. What it wants is a return to free movement. People love refugees coming in, moving into five-star hotels, living <laughs> in their neighbourhoods, taking benefits. We just don't jobs. understand. I, I, Silly us, we just don't know. We're, just too, th we're too thick. Thick. We're too thick to understand, aren't we? We didn't go to the right schools. We certainly didn't. <sighs> It's painful, isn't it? It's really, really painful. Do get in touch. I do want to hear from you about the uh, sacking of Suella Bravman. Was it the right decision? Does it make the Prime Minister weaker or stronger? I think it was the wrong decision. I think it makes him weaker. Do give us a call there on 03444991000. You can text on 87222. Tweet us on uh, x at Talk TV. Coming up after the break, we will continue our reaction to the breaking news this morning that Suella Bravman has been sacked as Home Secretary. Meanwhile, Vichy Sunak is seeking to tighten protest laws after this week of marches, for which he's now criticised the, the, the Home Secretary by Sackinka. Wonders will never cease. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Stay tuned. We're here. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. Me and you, conquer time. Who that wins? Happens. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am Sanz. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem Ooh, solved. Yes, yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying <laughs> this now. <laughs> Get right. uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, no, no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going going. To, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You'll be talking to me on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Don't forget to get in touch with me all morning. Uh, we're on all the socials at Talk TV or by text. You can uh, message us on 8722. You can give me a call as well on 0244-499-1000. Lots of people getting in touch. I'm asking you a very, very simple question. Your reaction to the breaking news this morning that the Prime Minister has sacked Fellow Bradman as Home Secretary. Was it the right decision? Was it the wrong decision? Tell us why. Uh, you think either way. Also, I'd love to know whether you think it makes the Prime Minister stronger or weaker. James Cleverley is going to take up the role of Home Secretary. He's moved from the Foreign Office. While extraordinary news this morning, David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, is to be the new Foreign Secretary. He's already been made a peer. Lord Cameron is the new Foreign Secretary. Well, this morning's reshuffle comes as the Prime Minister has ordered a tightening up of the laws surrounding protests after pro-Palestinian mobs blighted Armistice Day. And indeed, we saw far-right mobs as well. Well, before her sacking as Home Secretary, Suella Bravman said the streets of London are being polluted by hate, violence and anti-Semitism and that further action was necessary. I think the bit we're all confused by is the Prime Minister basically agreed with her, she was proved right and now he sacked her. Very bizarre. Well, I'm joined right now by Andy No, He's a US commentator and author of the best-selling book, Unmasked, and someone who's extensively covered far-left protests, both here and in America. Good morning to you, Andy. Um, Sam Armstrong's also with us. He's uh, giving us chuppance worth on all, all these big stories as well. Um, Andy, um, you are someone who, you've got extensive experience uh, following sort of Antifa and other marches and protests and very Black Lives Matters. And those extraordinary events been going on in America over the years, often also in Europe, uh, and you were there on Saturday. Who were you following and who were you most concerned about on the day? Uh, well, I uh, primarily was documenting the Million Man March for it Palestine. It wasn't a million man. It was 300,000 in the end, wasn't it? Yes. So uh, what I noticed is that, it, like previous weeks of these demonstrations, uh, the violence happens at night, and by then that's when the journalists from the mainstream outlets are, are home and have already completed and their stories and the headlines are out. They've gone along, they've got their footage and they said it's all fine and then they've gone home. Yeah, what I witnessed again were acts of, well, I should say pockets of violence, but, but were predictable and in line with things, in my view, that uh, the former Home Secretary uh, had described these demonstrations before. Violence against police, shooting um, mortar fireworks yeah. at law enforcement, uh, firing um, fireworks at cars that were Firework is a weapon. Yes, <laughs> I mean, people get injured from it. These are huge, uh, I mean, it's sh it's really shocking when it, one of them lands right next to you and it's ex explosive, right? Uh, it can burn you, uh, it can blind you, it can mm -hmm. disorient you. And we know while well, police officers are still in hospital, actually, after being uh, hit by a firework in the eye. There were 145 arrests on Saturday. Now, the Home Secretary, Sula Bradman, ex-Home Secretary, I should say, uh, she had warned that the, these protests were, were, you know, provocative and they were aggressive and the anti-Semitic chanting um, was unacceptable. Um, you know, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is an anti-Semitic chant. It's about this. Hamas is, is a terrorist, prescribed terrorist organisation. That is their chant and it's... It's used to say we want the destruction of Israel and indeed of the Jewish people. That is what their aim is in their founding documents. So she she warned about what was going on there. She, it was then claimed, and it has been claimed even a call, even today, even by the likes of the shadow um, uh, health secretary uh, where streeting that she is entirely to blame, he said, and, and poured petrol on the flames of these protests by basically roiling up riling up the uh, the right-wing elements of so the football hooligans, the sort of former you know, English Defence League right-wingers um, and others to sort of basically send the Bova boys to, uh, to the cenotaph to protect the cenotaph and to basically take on, uh, uh, take on the protest, these pro-Palestinians, but also the police. We did see trouble uh, among those people, not actually at the cenotaph where it was very peaceful and people were respectful, but we did see trouble. Oh, I am told, I was not there, I was told by numerous reporters who were there, that they, they, the police chose to kettle those, those protesters um, and therefore that led to some ructions. I don't think their behaviour was, uh, the behaviour of the protesters was remotely acceptable, I don't think they did anyone any good. But do you agree with the Prime, with, with, with the Home Secretary when she's talked about playing favourites and two-tier policing, that the decision to take on right-wing, far-right protesters in one way with the police, very proactive, very involved, very aggressive policing, but the policing of the pro-Palestinian march 
completely different, even with the sometimes caught on video, most outrageous anti-Semitism on display. What I witnessed was that the uh, Met Police were very quick to take out and use their batons against the mob, if you will, of, of the, the right-wing protesters. And, and indeed, some of them were bloodied. Um, whereas similar actions of um, pushing back against uh, police lines by pro-Palestine demonstrators uh, in previous weeks uh, were met with um, a much softer mm. approach. I, quite clearly a different approach. Now, the, the, the claim seems to be that there are more of them. We haven't got enough police officers. We can't take it on. We've got our drones. We've got our people with cameras. We're going to get the people afterwards who've committed trouble. We can arrest them later. That is often the style of policing. And yet we didn't see that with the, you know, the, right, the far right element. Yeah. And I, I mean, that, that perception has led to the uh, anger among some of the people who showed up um, uh, out, around and outside the, the Sunnitaf in Westminster. And I, I'm a bit shocked, or perhaps not shocked, but surprised to see uh, the former Home Secretary being uh, blamed for the, the things that happened around Westminster by the... Is it your vote. experience that the far right, and again, you have covered I mean, probably thousands of different marches over the years. You're, you're, you're very useful, but you have been around following this stuff up close and personal. You've been attacked yourself, left and the right. Um, the, the, the idea that a bunch of basic racist thugs weren't going to go to the Cenotaph, were going to sit at home, or go, I don't know, to the local shopping centre or a football match, but a, a, an ethnic minority home secretary told them, oh, well, I think there's going to be trouble. And they all went, oh, in that case, I'm going to turn up at the Senate after. Do you think that's likely? Well, what, when I was um, in the morning, when I was just paying attention to the conversations that were happening with the people that had gathered um, uh, around there, their anger seemed to be directed at what they viewed as um, the, the Met Police, mm -hmm. allowing weeks of disrespect uh, on monuments and, and... People put draping free Palestinian flags on the cenotaph. People, um, you know, even there was one uh, that was daubed free Palestine on, you know, in the, ahead of the weekend of remembrance. Yeah, I, I mean, I witnessed somebody mentioning being radicalised by the words of the former Home Secretary in, in the Times newspaper. I mean, in fact, I think her criticisms bore out over the weekend. And the... Some other instances that I, I witnessed from the pro-Palestine sign were really quite um, shocking, disturbing, if you will. Um, in Victoria Station, um, there was a mobbing of uh, Michael Gove. Yes, the levelling up secretary. You were there. I you took there. some of the footage that we've seen online of Michael. He was walking to the station. Now, there have been claims, even by some, frankly, you know, national broadcasters, which I think is quite shocking, saying this was staged. Apparently, he was trying to get uh, get to the train... He, could, he does take the train, most, most ministers and others do. He couldn't get through because there were road closures, so he got out and walked. He was mobbed in the street with people shouting, shame on you, shame on you. Police had to surround him. He walks into Victoria Station. He actually basically has to be bustled away by the police because of the aggressive behaviour and chanting. Um, I mean, that's completely unacceptable in a democracy. Yeah, the, the anger from these protesters at, at Victoria Station, I mean, they didn't just... In addition to targeting uh, Michael Gove, they targeted people who were wearing patriotic pins as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I witnessed... Wearing poppies. Yes. Uh, there was a, an elderly couple who were accosted uh, and then they had to be taken away by police because this mob was just becoming angry. So, wait, wait, so, so they were selling poppies, doing what people were wearing... No, wearing poppies. Wearing. And they were not... You, you will video this... I think I've seen this footage... You videoed them. They weren't. They weren't attacking the mob or the, the or the pro-Islamic, the pro-Palestinian pro protesters. They were just wearing poppies. They were showing their respect for veterans on. Yeah. Uh, uh, and on they Amos were led Day. away, but the pro-Palestinian group were allowed to continue. That's this is, and this is exactly what Suella Bradman talked about: two-tier policing. Yes. That, that is not what happened in... You know, no, there's no doubt that there are still hunts going on, manhunts for, you know, for, for various people who committed horrible anti-Semitic acts and, and chanting and flags and insignia uh, on the day, but also some right-wingers shouting horrible things and, fight and being racist. I mean, and I want all of them arrested. I want them all treated the same way. Um, what do you make of the idea, though, that 
You've got Channel 4 reporting, you know, oh, it's all about the all about the racist mob at Cenotaph, and BBC saying it was a largely peaceful event. But it's only peaceful because the police don't challenge the criminality, which is clearly an utterly... It's, it's not two people on, on a march of 300,000. It is clearly hundreds, if not a few thousand people on these marches who are shouting and chanting and showing showing, you know, racist, anti-Semitic, racist insignia and, and the like. Um, if, you, if you only watch Channel 4, you only read The Guardian or read the BBC website, you will think one event happened. This, the day's events came off a certain way. If you use other media as well, you will know a completely different story. That is very dangerous territory, isn't it? If we can't even all agree what happened... Well, I mean, the, the firewall of uh, uh, the mainstream media is being broken through independent and citizen journalists who are just out there recording incidents that the BBC is not at, Channel 4 is not at, yeah. ITV is not at. And they at. can't be every single place. But just because they didn't witness it themselves, if it's on video and then they're denying it's happened. Yeah, yeah, but these incidents are not particularly even hard to find. You just show up and you see it all over. And I, I think, I mean, the, the media and activists are falling back on familiar narratives about the, the far left when previous weeks people have been forced to confront a, a very uncomfortable reality. Again, I think questions about immigration integration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, we can't discuss that because that makes us all xenophobic, racist bigots. I mean, that's, that's what's going on in this country. We have to, we have to pretend we can't have that. You know, that conversation is too dangerous. Um, and, you know, absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you. And thank you very much indeed for the video footage you put out. You know. um, Sam Armstrong, your reaction? Yeah, well, two-tier policing claiming that got the actual Home Secretary yeah. of this country fired, dismissed. Yeah. If you even countenance the suggestion that that is occurring, you are unfit for public office. That's what our media believe. That's what the story we've seen over the past few years. And yet, what happens when established, experienced journalists go and watch, and he's not from this country, he's coming over to go and watch it, he's saying, what do I see? You say I it wasn't hard to find. <laughs> Two-tier policing right there in front of you. You can't even say the truth in this country anymore if you want to exist in politics. Why? Well, because this country is for the grown-ups, people that lie to the public, people that don't tell the public what they see because they don't want to inflame the situation, and people that just pursue the same yeah. old liberal yeah. policies yeah. year after year. And let's just year. all pretend that people aren't chanting anti-Semitic things and that, and that, and that a, a synagogue that's sort of a few minutes walk from my home, they didn't have people, didn't have to have police to let the families leave the synagogue safely to, to take them home because of the, the chanting by, by the pro-Palestinian protesters outside. I mean, I'm sorry, let's just all pretend it's not happening and it's all OK. And that is what we're... We are in double-think territory here. You know, you... Ignore the evidence before your eyes and your ears. Is it any wonder Jews in this country are, as we speak, looking for flights to yep. Israel to move there? Yep, Australia? absolutely. It's just appalling. Well, I've been asking you the question today about the uh, Prime Minister's decision to sack Home Secretary Swella Brabham for telling the truth, as Sam Armstrong said. I want to know, was it the right decision? Does it make him weaker, stronger? Uh, tell us why. Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Well, Andy has done just that. He says uh, Rishi obviously doesn't like anyone who comes out with true Tory values. Labour must be laughing out loud. Oh, they are. And Sandra has texted to say, Starmer will wipe the floor with Sunak. Now Braverman has gone. Uh, let's also uh, hear from Brendan in Hartlepool. He's on the line right now. Good Good morning to you, Brendan. Good morning, Julia. Good. <laughs> I am in what will be a former Red Wall seat. <laughs> ah, yeah, very, very good point. What, what did you make of that decision? Unbelievable. I don't know. Um, I, when Sunni first, I first noticed him when he, he was the Chancellor, and I thought, oh, he, he's, he's going to do well. He's not, he's actually, he's as bad as the rest of them. We haven't had a decent Tory Prime Minister since. Um, Probably, uh, probably Mrs. Thatcher, to be honest with you, because John Major wasn't, and they never said it's disastrous for the Tory party. I'm going to, unfortunately, I'll be voting for your colleague, Mr. Tyson Hartlepool. He won't get elected, but it'll, it'll be my little protest vote. It is what they should do, they should actually call an election now, so we'll get Labour in quicker, and we'll have that means we'll get rid of them quicker because they'll only last one term because they won't be doing any good. And then Suella can become pri uh, leader of the Tories and um, 
hopefully be the uh, next except many Prime say Minister. that many say she actually although she's much loved by the, uh, the the Tory voters that actually Tory MPs are not fans and they won't back her and of course give that Tory you know that Tory election system it's got to go through the final two the top two candidates uh, oh, yes, from, course, from the yeah. MPs yeah. So they're not going to let her on that list uh, and if it's as, as Sam said it's the Nadine Doris is right there's the, there's the cabal in the background who won't let her become for the, the leader of the Tory party will he no it's a, it's a total disaster I, I, I'm at a loss what to do I've been a I've been a Tory all my life and I was overjoyed when we eventually got a Tory MP for Hartlepool uh, it's, it's all going to go backwards for me. Yeah, it's fascinating, and, um, isn't it? Well, um, Brendan, really appreciate you calling. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up after the break, the NHS is failing to see more patients than before the pandemic, despite having a bigger budget and more staff. So what's going on? And why one in six GP surgeries now only allow online appointments? I'm Julia hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, we're going to briefly, but only very briefly, leave uh, the reshuffle behind. But I have a funny feeling that the NHS is going to be such a big issue at the next general election. It's going to be key part of this big reshuffle from Rishi Sunak today, anyway. Now, the NHS is failing to see more patients than before the pandemic, despite having a much higher budget and more staff. A review is underway into productivity in the health service, with the Treasury pressing for improvements before the autumn statement. That's next week. 
how that's going to happen. This comes as the news emerges that one in six GP surgeries are now only taking bookings for online appointments. Well, how do you do that if you're elderly and you don't have an online ability? Well, joining me right now to discuss all of this is Martin Gally. He's a former NHS Trust chair and joins us now. Good morning to you, Martin. Good morning, Julia. Thank what an exciting for... morning. What an exciting morning. Well, there is some talk, of course, that the, uh, the Health Secretary, uh, uh, Steve Barclay, hasn't actually perhaps been able to sort of take the battle to the shadow Health Secretary, uh, Wes Street, and considered to be one of Labour's top performers. Uh, and who knows whether he's going to be moved in his job as well today. But we shall wait and see what happens there. Any new developments, I must say to everyone watching and listening, anything new coming out on the reshuffle, any developments, we will bring them to you here first at Talk TV. But, Martin... We know that a lot of the things that the Home Secretary has just been sacked was, was charged with dealing with, like stopping the boats and all of these issues, were key, key pledges from uh, Rishi Sunak. Uh, but we also, another key one is sorting out NHS waiting lists. Piles and piles of money, new staff, waiting lists still going up, things aren't getting any better, less productive than ever. What's going wrong? Well, I think there's a couple of things on, on this, um, Julia. One is that this is quite a patchy situation. Um, it just happens that where I live, we don't have those sorts of issues. We, can, I mean, I've had three appointments in the last couple of months with a GP, nothing serious, but each time I've been able to get in on the same day as I phoned them. Um, I, I was asked to have an MRI scan and I had it in, in a couple of days. So honestly, it's not everywhere. However, when you talk about having more staff, for example, more GPs, often more and more GPs are going part time. Yeah. So although the actual numbers employed go up, the actual numbers who are uh, the hours that they're working have been reduced. The full time equivalent, and you've actually got fewer people doing the work and of course also much less efficient work because you often haven't got then the uh, um, as a GP's daughter, I know this, you, know, you haven't got the continuity of cares. And, oh, hello, Mrs Jones. Yes, now I saw you last week, so let's carry on with that treatment. Is that is someone going, hello, Mrs Jones, tell me what your problems are? You're not going to get efficient treatment. And, and, Julia, in hospitals, obviously handovers, which are yeah. quite time-consuming um, from one group to another. Um, obviously, the strikes haven't helped, although I don't think the impact of them has been as great as, as some people think from, from the numbers I look at. There's a high level of sickness. There's a high level of, for example, consultants who do uh, elective work in hospitals, moving their services to the private sector. Yeah. Um, there's more locums. There are more agency staff. And, you know, going back to GPs, I noted that my surgery I attend out of nine GPs, only three are full time. Yeah. Um, so you know, there's, there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. As but far the as the worst, but the thing is, the thing is, we're constantly the told we need to spend more money in the NHS. This is what Labour says. It's what Lib Dems say. Yes, everyone says you need to spend more money. We're spending a load more money now. Admittedly, you know, you can't train up a doctor in two weeks. Of course, you can't. But again, by the way, David Cameron back in government, he was the person who limited the number of doctors and nurses who could be trained in this who are British in this country. I mean, that's the sort of level of insane policy we've had in recent years. But but there comes a point when more money is not delivering more health treatment. Mm -hmm then maybe money isn't the answer. And we're spending around the same as our European neighbours are spending. And they don't have the issue with waiting lists, but then they didn't virtually close down their health service yeah. when the lockdown period was on. Yeah, but a lot, of, no, a lot of these waiting lists started long before lockdown. I mean, a good two thirds of this waiting list was sitting there before 2020. But the chances of, do, of getting it, it, it moving during the period of lockdown was virtually impossible. Mm. Um, and a lot of people put off even going to see a GDP, even yeah. though they weren't well or were suffering pain. Yeah. And now we're getting all those people presenting to the system and, with, and needing, with more needing serious care. problems. OK, so yes. I'll put you in charge of the entire NHS right now. What do you do? Right. Well, in the short term, uh, we have to allow things to drift towards the private sector. And that includes NHS commissioners commissioning the private sector, which they're already doing to quite a large extent. That needs to be to be done more. Um, we need to recruit more nurses and, and other professional staff, allied health professionals. We need to recruit them from abroad. We shouldn't need to have to do that, but we will in the short term. Um, but I also think that the, the NHS needs to give a bit more freedom to the system 
uh, for example, the, the, the I mean, if I was still a chair, I would have come down very heavily on the level to which the focus has gone. I feel as if the focus has become allied to diversity and, and all this yeah. sort of thing. Get on with doing the zero. job of treating people. I think you went round the houses on that one. Just do the job of getting people better and keeping them alive and forget everything else. They shouldn't have net zero officers, diversity officers, all of that. Martin Garrett, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you um, very thought, much. Judith. Thoughts from um, Sam Armstrong uh, on this. Look, the NHS is definitely it's one of the five pledges. No way, there's no way Rishi Sunak is going to cut those waiting lists. No, of the five pledges, maybe, maybe inflation, but the four that actually he had something to do with, he's not palmed off to the Bank of England, and to snowball's chance... Whether it's May Hades, or next October, it's not going to happen. ..that he is going to hit those pledges by the end of the year. And some of them, he were as explicit, are about the end of the year. On the NHS, just remember... Never had more money. This isn't a service that is underfunded. It's badly managed. And it's been badly managed by the Conservative Party. For whatever reason, they can be worried that Labour's going to criticise them for taking the tough decisions. I, I think it's but... going to be fascinating if Labour do get in next year, um, how much things aren't going to improve. And, and, the, and, the, and the health unions will, will be going, well, hold on a minute, you're supposed to be on our side. I think it's going to be absolutely fascinating to watch. We're a year out from an election. Labour will have five years. I predict in five years' time, you and I will be sitting here and we will be saying, why on earth did we do that? This is just, things have just got worse. Well, indeed. Well, we shall wait and see. Um, thank you very much, Sam Armstrong. Coming up after the break, uh, James Cleverly has replaced Suella Braverman as Home Secretary and David Cameron has taken up the role of Foreign Secretary. Yes, the former Prime Minister, now Lord Cameron. We're going to be talking about that and more on the pro-Palestine and counter-protests at the weekend. As Rishi Sunak says, he's uh, seeking to give police more powers to ban marches. Well, why is he doing that when he's just sacked his Home Secretary for saying they should be banned. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, on your smart speaker. Do not go away. We're here. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening. I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored, in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. Me and you, conquer time. Who that wins? Happens. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for this? You like, I'm so rich. <laughs> <laughs> uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem Ooh, solved. Yes, yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after <laughs> this now. <laughs> Get right. uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing an interview. Why? We'll explain why. 
How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Well, the Prime Minister has sacked the Home Secretary, Swella Bradman, this morning with a wider cabinet reshuffle still ongoing. James cleverly has moved from the Foreign Office to take up the role as the new Home Secretary. And David Cameron, yes, that David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, is now Lord Cameron and the new Foreign Secretary. This comes after a week of speculation over Swella Bradman's position after she was accused of stoking tensions ahead of the Armistice Day protest. A total of 145 people were arrested on Saturday during the pro-Palestine march and far-right counter-protest. But wasn't she proved right? So why has she been sacked? That's my question for you today for the Prime Minister's decision to sack the Home Secretary Swella Bradman. Was it the right decision? Was it the wrong decision? Tell us why you think it was, why it wasn't. I'd love to know whether you think it makes him stronger or weaker. You can give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text on 8722 or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. First thing, let's get the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good afternoon. Former Prime Minister David Cameron has been appointed as the new Foreign Secretary as Rishi Sunak reshuffles his cabinet. David Cameron's replacing James Cleverly, who's been appointed as the new Home Secretary. Well, Swella Braverman was sacked from her role by the Prime Minister this morning over accusations she stoked tensions at this weekend's protests in London. And in response, David Cameron says though he may have disagreed with some individual decisions made by Rishi Sunak, the PM is a strong and capable leader. Our correspondent Oliver Whitfield Mircic is live at Downing Street. Ollie, what's the reaction to Cameron's new position? Emily, certainly amongst those more conservative, centrist MPs, they are certainly happy that David Cameron has come back into the fold to lead one of the great officers of state. We've seen the likes of former Prime Minister Theresa May tweeting out her congratulations. But for allies of Suella Braverman, they are absolutely furious at what has come to pass, with some talk that some of those allies may meet later on in Parliament to discuss what a Suella Braverman leadership bid would look like. Thanks, Ollie. Well, we've also had some resignations today. What's the latest? We've heard earlier on that there were four junior ministers who have now left. Jesse Norman, the latest, a junior minister from the Department for Transport, has gone. Interestingly, Therese Coffey, who came into Downing Street at about 10 o'clock, is still inside Downing Street. The Prime Minister had been at Parliament for about half an hour carrying out more sacking, so we're waiting to see now who will be coming in to number 10 to be given plum new jobs. Thank you very much, Ollie. In other news now, five people have died and one person is missing after a devastating house fire in West London. Police say those who died are all believed to be members of the same family. Around 70 firefighters battled the blaze overnight as it tore through a property in Hounslow. The father of Indy Gregory says he's angry after the eight-month-old at a centre of a legal battle died following the withdrawal of her life support treatment. Indy's parents wanted specialists to keep treating her rare condition that affected how her body used energy. Well, doctors went to the court to stop treatment, saying she was in too much pain and distress. The Royal Mail has been fined £5.6 million for failing to deliver post on time in what the regulators called a wake-up call for the organisation. It's supposed to deliver more than 90% of first and second class letters within one and three days, but actual times fell well below this. And around 100,000 homes and businesses are without power in Ireland as Storm Debbie makes landfall. Flooding is also expected in parts of Northern Ireland and we're being warned to expect severe and damaging weather in the UK with more heavy rain and strong winds on the way. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather and more on Storm Debbie with Nazni Gaffer.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. So far today, Storm Debbie has brought a lot of rain and very strong damaging winds. Gusts in excess of 70 miles per hour, in particular across the northwest of England and Wales. And that rain that started across much of England, Wales and southern Scotland and Northern Ireland is now shoved up towards parts of Scotland for this afternoon, where there's some heavy downpours likely. Not great news for eastern parts of Scotland, where there's a warning from the Met Office. There's also a warning for northern and western parts of England and Wales. Winds still remain strong across these areas, with some rainfall likely. But a drier picture generally this afternoon for Wales, England and for Northern Ireland, but there will be blustery showers across these areas. Now, overnight, Storm Debbie clears off into the North Sea, so it calms down. Winds will ease, but it remains blustery and there will be lots of showers around and there will be some hefty downpours by the early hours of the morning down towards the southwest of England. It will be a fairly mild night, perhaps a touch of frost across some sheltered spots of Scotland. Then through tomorrow, it's a day of sunshine and showers, some really heavy downpours initially across central and southern parts of England and and Wales through the morning, but they should clear by the afternoon. However, lots of showers will be on the cards in between drier and brighter spells. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Coming up in this hour, more on the cabinet reshuffle that's been taking place this morning that's seen Suella Braverman sacked as Home Secretary and extraordinarily David Cameron, yes, that one, the former Prime Minister, back into the cabinet as Foreign Secretary. Well, today I'm asking you about uh, the, particularly the decision to sack Suella Braverman. Uh, this, uh, uh, as uh, we, well, discovered that the Prime Minister basically knows that what she said was the right thing when she warned about the problems that would happen on Saturday with that pro-Palestinian march and, of course, the far right turning out as well. He's already said that he wants to have more uh, uh, laws around controlling protests. So why is he sacking the woman who said the very thing last week? Do get in touch. Give us a call on 0344 499 You can text on 8722. You can get in touch on X as well at Talk TV. Well, aside from the cabinet reshuffle, the Prime Minister is considering giving the police more powers to immediately arrest anti-Semitic protesters, although I'm pretty sure they could do that already if they want to. It comes after a total of 145 people were arrested on Saturday during the pro-Palestine march and far-right counter-protest. The vast majority of those, by the way, were at the far-right uh, counter-protest, but that's because the police didn't really police a lot of the pro-Palestinian protesters. Critics of the Home Secretary accused Suella Braverman of fueling the far-right protest scene on Saturday. Well, joining me now to talk about all of this is uh, Caelan Robertson. He's a journalist and co-founder at Byline TV. Uh, good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. Now, I, I must point out also, you are somebody who used to work with Tommy Robinson. Uh, you also worked with the uh, US conspiracy theorist Alex Jones as well. You've gone around a range of a range of different people. Tommy Robinson, I must ask about him first. He was among those who was uh, uh, staging part of those counter protests uh, on Saturday. They got a lot of criticism for apparently you know, being there. And then suddenly, when things started kicking off, getting into a taxi covered ironically in LGBTQ rainbows and disappearing from the scene um, to head back to his uh, his uh, uh, his island home abroad. Um, just first of all, um, why do you think the right wingers, the no, not right wingers, the far right, ex EDL types, why do you think they turned up on Saturday? Were they genuinely concerned? You worked with these people. Were they genuinely concerned about the cenotaph being desecrated, being defaced, and under attack? Well, knowing knowing those types of people, the reason the far right were there was because of the rhetoric from. Uh, Suella Braverman, who said that the um, police were favouring the Palestinian side, they were letting them get away with uh, illegal activities, who which, pitted the which police they against were, each it's other, all on video. Uh, who made the police's job really, really difficult, who called the other side a hate march, who basically made it seem like there was going to be sort of terrorist sympathy and massive amounts of Hamas support allowed all over London. But there had, that, but okay, but there but had but been allowed. the previous four no, weeks. But it wasn't, yeah, it, it wasn't allowed in the previous four weeks. And the police have all openly said recently as well that Suella made her, their job more difficult because of her rhetoric, because she basically would rather have the far right there than um, people who are pro Why would she rather have the far right because there? Because her views are far more aligned with that. If you look at the rhetoric views, she's put out, of course a, they are. The Rwanda policy no, 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 is extremely no, 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 right-wing, okay. of course. So, so an ethnic minority Minority Home Secretary married to a Jewish man would rather have the far right 
She's sympathetic to their views. They she's, the, she's got more in common people, with Tommy Robinson than someone marching Julia, supposedly those people for people are peace there for Pasta. Samala Braverman. Joe Politics interviewed them and they all said that she was great. It was her rally call that got them there. It wasn't really Tommy Robinson. You say, you say, you, you're saying, you're saying that if Samala Braverman hadn't written that article for The Times, obviously, bearing in mind, because these people are all avid readers of The Times newspaper. They don't read if The Times, but they can no, see it. Screen, it. But we okay. know how the news so, works. Okay. Like, if you so write something in The Bra Times, no. it's screenshotted on Twitter, the headlines get put out, they see that rhetoric. They see that. All been happily at the you know trailing their wives around the local shop. Well, why is this happening? Why, why, why are we seeing the far rights on the street now? Tommy's been around for years. We haven't seen this in the last few years on our streets. We're seeing it now because of the recent think, rhetoric from no, Suella Braverman. I think we've That's seen why we're seeing it now. And I think a lot of hosts who are in, 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 complicit in this, a lot of right-wing yes. media, the guests that you had on your show on Friday, Douglas Murray, said that the oh, Cenotaph was going to be, uh, on Thursday, was going to be desecrated. They were going to be nowhere near that. So right-wing TV hosts and the right-wing government have facilitated this, allowed it, and now they're all saying, oh, no, no, it wasn't Suella. It wasn't any of us. Right. It was Tommy so Robinson. So previous it marches was the EDL. have been around Whitehall. The march wasn't around Whitehall because they're doing security preparations ahead of Remembrance Sunday, so that wasn't going to be allowed. But previously, they would have been. Uh, the march, we were told, was going to be a couple of hours. It wasn't going to start until a couple of hours after as well. People were well on the streets around 11 o'clock in the morning, long, you know, around when people were, were marking Armistice Day at 11 o'clock and our fallen heroes. Um, People were on the streets. I don't I do not hold a candle for the, the far right, for the racists, for Tommy Robinson, any of those people. Got no time for them at all. They just create more problems. Um, and, and, and a lot of them just frankly want to rock. There's a lot of football. They just want to have a and rock. Well, okay. gave them an excuse. No, no, she, she, she basically them, said it was no, allowed. They didn't, no, she the said excuse they could go was, to the Senate no, and the Palestinians no, weren't Kayla, allowed Kayla, She the, allowed it. The excuse was given to them by the failure of the police to actually take on the, the Islamist, the pro-Hamas, the anti-Semitic people so among, you want the police to do a better job, right? Those pro you, you want march. the police to do a better job, yes? You're a fan of law and order. Well, no, I want the police to do their job. You are. But are you a fan of the police doing a good job and there being law and order? Yes. Well, then you should hate what Suella's done, which is to undermine them. That's why their jobs are becoming more difficult. They didn't... No, they didn't... <laughs> They, their job wasn't undermined by Suella Braverman. You championed her the whole time. You said that she's no, great. The, the, you started the, the show this morning by saying that she said nothing wrong. She's done no, nothing I, wrong. No, that's not because true. Because you built her up Kaylen, and now that, you don't want to take responsibility Kaylen, for Kaylen, that's not done. true. I was very critical of some of her language that she used. I said the language comparing it with marches in Northern Ireland and the use of the term hate marches. I was very, very critical but of her. But you tweeted I, on Saturday that yep. there were hate marches. Jess Phillips no, said Jess hate marches Phillips and you said, said yes. hate march. And I went, yes, because there so were... So you agree they're hate marches? No, because... Then, no, they are not all hate marchers. I've said repeatedly, I think most of the people on that march genuinely believe that they are they are campaigning for peace. They don't want babies to die in hospitals in Gaza. So then why did you I think there are a useful lot of there are there are useful idiots who are just frankly sixth form politics debating people who don't understand. And I think, yes, there is a large minority of people who are anti-Semitic, troublemakers, pro-Hamas. And dangerous people. Who were the mass? And the who police were the majority were doing of people. Who were the people? The majority of people arrested on Saturday. What side was the majority arrested? But which if side? The, if the police only tackled the, the right, right wing wingers, side. then what a surprise! The right, the right, not right, it's the far right. That they're they're the people who are going to be arrested. We've got footage after footage of people on the pro-Palestinian side, you saying, saying kill Jews, carrying anti-Semitic uh, placards. Um, shouting chants from the river to the sea, uh, uh, anti-Semitic chants, and, and the police doing nothing about because it. Because their jobs are being made more difficult by Michael the Home Secretary. A mob through a station, no arrests for that. Because and you're saying, oh, made... well, most of the rest were the far right, so they must have been the troublemakers. But, but... If you don't arrest people on one side, then, yes, funnily enough, there'll be more arrests on the other you're side. You're not on the side of the police. You're on the side of Swella Braverman, who makes I'm on the lives side more of... difficult. I'm not on the you're... side of the police. I'm on the side of law and order But you've order just said the country. solution to this is to give the police more power to take control of this and to deal with... No, the, I, the government the said the chance, solution was. The they don't chance. need more powers to arrest people you know, who are breaking the law. I'm not defending they have all it, you the know, powers they need. I'm not some lefty here defending the pro-Palestinian march. I wouldn't go on that march. I don't even subscribe to that kind of politics. But and the chance that they were putting out, the anti-Semitic chance, my Jewish friends were horrified, they should be dealt with by the police. Why weren't the they dealt with the on law. the day? Because their jobs were made more difficult by the Home Secretary. Well, and they admit that no, in no, the No, no, there were They've no far that. right on the streets the last four weeks. And, and I, like you, my Jewish friends and family members, absolutely horrified and terrified, won't let their children go into central London. Those last four weeks, the police weren't, they weren't 
They weren't dealing with Suella Braverman's rhetoric. What was their excuse for those first four weeks? The first four weeks were more and more difficult. She basically whipped everyone up into a frenzy. She said that they were hate marchers and the very what was small the excuse number for the of first people. Four weeks? The first four weeks was the fact that Israel's Total failure been, to arrest those was, people. The reason that they're all there is because Israel's been bombing Gaza and destroying children in hospitals. So a lot of people go out in the streets they don't want to see. Well, I mean, they have. What been was the excuse for the police hospitals? not acting and not arresting people at the moment where they commit those blatant crimes? Journalists after journalists, journalists can find these people in, and suddenly the, the police surrounding them apparently completely unable to well, see they took action after. A lot of the time our police forces aren't equipped to understand some of the Islamic slogans that we first saw on the streets, some trained. of the flags and actually when it was highlighted on Twitter what these things were, what these symbols were, they took action and they went after those people. It was just because a they were... A few, a handful of people. But those were the... A handful that, but only a handful it of wasn't, people were... No, were, were no, I, there's plenty of footage. There's there. ten yeah. people on Saturday. There's a ha way more than a handful of people yeah. chanting those things and people walking happily by. I'm just saying, you know, if I walked happily by someone, you know, shouting death to Jews on, who had a swastika on his, on his arm and was, a, you know, a rough, far right person, you would rightly say, how dare you stand there and allow that to happen? If you're walking down the road alongside people who are shouting death to Jews, I'm sorry, you are, you, you, you are part of that. Yes, but also but Some... what's part of that is, is the guests who have been on this show and parts of our government that have facilitated and facilitated. encouraged, facilitated and encouraged those far-right people to go to the Senate. So, wait, so, so pointing out it. facts is facilitating and encouraging the far-right. Uh, I mean, you probably are... They're not facts. They're not no, no, facts no. because Douglas Murray saying on the show with you nodding along that they're going to desecrate the Senate, Senate tap is no, not I, facts. No, I didn't nod along to him saying they're going to... He said there is a risk of that. That is what... But that's they, not facts. No, we've already seen... We have already... That's not facts. We have already seen... A, a war memorial desecrated with Free Palestine put on it. We've already seen flags draped on. On the very first march, I think it was the first or the second march, where we saw the protests that was set up next to the center top. It was inappropriate. It's not the normal form. Sam Armstrong, over to you. You're desperate to get it. I'm so see. glad that Kaylin's worked it all out. There was no far right wow. until Suella Braverman, the first Buddhist ethnic minority uh, female uh, home secretary this country's ever had well, came along. I mean, well, came yeah. along, and she decided she was going to send Tommy Robinson and all of the rest of it subtle, un imperceptible secret messages. It wasn't very imperceptible. It was pretty clear. It's of pretty the clear. Times of London Finish. is hardly the far right journal of record to go to. This is where it gets mad. There is this huge leap between Suella Braverman saying and pointing out something that lots of people are feeling, and the far right turning up. Many of them don't like her, and it's, and it's unfair to say that many of them do like her. And we saw horrible, well, racist, it's not unfair. horrible racist attacks directed against Suella Braverman. And there is a madness in this country. If we don't think that the far right were likely to have been upset all by themselves at the sight of Islamist extremists committing terrorist offences, threatening to march past the Cenotaph on, of all days, Armistice Days. You are lying to people Not, when you they were say emboldened. that they were okay, emboldened. Come they on, were what emboldened. does that mean? If, 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 the far right, if the far right are given an opportunity to take to the streets and if they are told that the police will be on their side, the police aren't going to be upholding law and order by the Home Secretary, they will take that opportunity and they will commit violence. They, that is but, why this has happened. No, no, no. It has nothing to no, do with Tommy they, they or any of these distractions. That. I'm not defending their, what they did at all. They they, didn't, they, they just don't help anyone's cause uh, except, except you know, people who want to criticise them and quite rightly criticise them for what they've done. However, the key thing is that it wasn't they felt that the police weren't taking action. The police weren't taking action. The police were, were. offering two-tier policing. Sorry, if the police were acting so, so perfectly, why on earth were so many Jewish people afraid to be in town? If the police were acting so perfectly, why were people not arrested for chanting uh, pro-Hamas slogans? If the police were acting correctly, why was Sir Mark Rowley, the Met Chief, dragged into Downing Street by the Home Secretary, sorry, the Prime Minister, given a dressing down and told to, to deal with this, obviously, deal with the, no, he couldn't persuade Mark Rowley no. to actually uh, um, ban this march. Now, look, I didn't actually call for this march to be banned. I said, if it's late or in the day and it's on the other side of London, but it's properly policed, that's fine. But there is never, it's never ever acceptable that there should be any sort of protest or march in, a, in any city, any town or city in this country, where what the way that people are behaving is intimidating to other people, not people taking offence or not agreeing with them. I'm very happy for people to do marches I disagree with. But if there are a, lot, there are a constituency of people in this country who are scared because of their ethnicity and their religion, because of what these, pe these some of these people on these marches are doing, and by the way, these marches, some of the organisers are ex-Hamas, for God's sake. They're from a prescribed terrorist organisation. There's a clue about what their aims are. 
if that is going on, the police have a duty to act. Yes, and to say that this is all rhetoric and is stirring up is a nonsense. But everything you said is correct, right up until the last point, which is that the police need to take action. But you're supporting a woman that undermines the police. So it how totally did, how counteracts did, how does? How does me support, how does Suella Bravman, the Home Secretary as was, it was literally her job to oversee what the police do. How does her saying, I want the police to do the job they're paid to do to protect all the people in this country, well, that's not how is that said. undermining the police? She said that they were picking said. sides and she said that they Which weren't they were. going to uphold law and order. Which okay, so then the police were. then the police spokespeople who said that they undermined them, they're they're lying, they're crazy. They're, no, but hang on. Hang we on. shouldn't listen to the police hang spokespeople. On, Taylor, we should just listen to each other Taylor, on our social you've, media. You've admitted that the police have a policy with Islamists to look at the what is said. Arrest later, yep. not at the time. In part, they say the police, they do that to prevent disorder at the time. They don't have enough police to deal with that many people. It would cause disorder if they were to arrest at the time. With the far right, they take a different approach. They preemptively arrest, they arrest, I think, 75 people in Pimlico to prevent a breach of the peace. Those two approaches are worlds apart. Now, I'm not saying those approaches are wrong, but that is two tier policing. That is, one is being arrested before the fact to prevent the breach of the peace. The other is not even being arrested at the time because there would be disorder. I mean, that is two-tier policing. There's been, I mean, also, the reason those people were preemptively arrested is because they were the ones who already started the violence at 10 o'clock in the morning before anyone else had arrived, and they'd already been throwing bottles no, But hang police. on, answer my Our question. Is that two-tier policing? Is there, is, are there two tiers operating there? Well, there's a there's a two there's an entirely parallel system where there's the police trying to do their job and the Home Secretary trying to undermine no, no, them. There aren't question, any other Caleb. things. There's there's a difficulty when you're policing because oh, there come are, on, there just, are... just admit it. Just admit they it. Off, they, they, they policed those two different One groups of people completely differently. And you know why they did it differently, and we know why One they is, did it differently. But we're not allowed to say it out loud. One is waving signs in different languages that take a little bit longer to figure out, and one are people throwing from bottles of the police. From the river the to police. the sea is in English. That's also not illegal to say from the river to the sea. That's not an illegal chant, and it's not an arrestable. It's the chant of a terrorist organization. I agree with you. It's disgusting, but it's not illegal, and it's also not as explicit as throwing a bottle at the police and and, what, and doing a bag what, of coke what, what and what having a big punch at the Saying saying, oh, let's kill all Jews. That's that's quite explicit. It that is. was happening. And those people should be people outside a synagogue near my home, um, actually haranguing people and shouting abuse at people who were who were leaving the synagogue families having to be escorted by police i wasn't in london or such otherwise i would have driven down there and helped to uh, make sure those people were safe myself I, i'm absolutely appalled by what was going on we've seen footage after footage video footage after video footage where you can see that the police just even when they themselves are being pushed the michael gove the footage taken by andy noah previous guest the, the michael gove being chanted at and, and pushed at police having to push people back Again, you don't see the police grabbing those people and arresting again, those people. And it's the police themselves who are saying that they have been undermined by the Home Secretary. But I agree with you right up until that last point. Writing an article with the close. Times I mean you can't yeah. arrest people who are threatening a bloody cabinet minister walking through a train station in this country. They're being undermined by the Home Secretary. Oh my God, Caleb. Yeah. God, I've got to stop shouting too much on this show. <laughs> but genuinely, Caleb Robbins. <laughs> Really, look, I really appreciate you coming in. He's with a byline at TV now. He was uh, there. Well, I saw some of the saw some of the events on the day. Thank you very much. Calm, breathe, everybody. Caelan, and it is like double. It's Orwellian. Don't don't believe what you're seeing and hearing, everybody. Just 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 believe what they're telling you, even if you've seen it with your own eyes and ears. <sighs> I've been asking for your reaction today, though, to the Prime Minister's decision to sack Suella Bravman as Home Secretary. If it was the right decision, Tom says, the appointment of David Cameron just confirms the remainer bias in the Tory party. Brexiteers are slowly being removed. Well, ain't that the case? Simon has texted, I can safely say that as a member of the Tory party, I will no longer vote for this shower of fools. If we have a leadership contest, that may be the only way to keep Labour out. Please, for the love of God, not another Tory leadership contest. And Claire says, Suella Bravman was the only Tory with a backbone. God help are already failing government, right. Well, yeah, don't forget, you can also call in as well on 03444991000. David is in Glasgow and he's done just that. Good afternoon to you, David. Calm me down for the love of God, calm me down. No, no, I, I mean, Julie, you're quite right with your conversation that you had there. This is the position that we're in today, yeah? So you're quite right to have that. I'm, I'm angry with the whole thing as well. But let's follow on from your conversation there. The vast bulk of it's been fueled by foreign sources, you know, whether that's the, the conflict that's happening in Gaza and Israel, from Iraq, from all sorts of places. Hamas, right? Iran, Russia where... and China are loving this. Exactly, yeah. So we're sitting here today with a position of a foreign secretary of the United Kingdom 
who's not a member of the House of Commons. Very All good right? point. Yep. Yeah, and he's not he's not um, responsible to the MPs. He's not accountable. Right? He's not accountable. He's not accountable, right? And I can tell you this: I've already started to look on various sources, and various countries are already commenting on this: how weak a position yep. the UK now is, yep. right? So you've just had this discussion, right? Yeah? And it's going to get even worse because now the foreign secretary. James, uh, cleverly before, was a fantastic foreign secretary. You know, brilliant what we did in the, the conflict that we're in. Now you've got David Cameron, an elected, you know, an unelected official for, from the House of Lords. And I can tell you this, that the countries are just not going to accept them. Yeah. I mean, uh, you're right, the accountability aspect is something we haven't discussed yet on yeah. the show, and it's a very, very good point. And we've had that with some other sort of senior figures, you know, health ministers and like, but, but someone in the, one of the four great offices of state who cannot be questioned by MPs. I'm assuming he will have to submit to much more regular questioning by, uh, you know, select committee uh, uh, and the like. But again, it's not the same as people being able to challenge him, any MP they, who wants, in the House of Commons. Um, mm -hmm. because he won't be able to enter the chamber. It's, it's, it's apparently, I would love to know what uh, like Peter Card will know, uh, has to say about this, you know, or anybody in talk to TV, well, but apparently the MPs can, can, allow, can, uh, can put a motion forward to remove an individual from the House of Commons, i.e. somebody like David Cameron, because he's not, he's not an elected official. Now, well, I wouldn't be surprised we've, we've got, if that We've got Peter Card will coming back on, so we'll get him back on and, and ask him that. Um, David and Glasgow, thank you very much. Really good point there. Coming up Thanks, after there. the break, David Cameron is back, as we've just been discussing in Frontline Politics, as the new Foreign Secretary taking over from James Cleverley, who's now the new Home Secretary after Swella Broadman got sacked. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, on your smart speaker. Do not go away.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You'll be Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Don't forget, you can get in touch with me anytime on all the socials. That's at Talk TV or by text. You can text 87222. Or you can give me a call at 0344 499 1000. Lots of amazing calls today. Today, of course, we're talking about the Prime Minister sacking the Home Secretary, Swella Bradman. Was it the right decision? Tell us why it was, why it wasn't. Do you agree with it? Also, crucially, do you think it's made him weaker or stronger? I think pretty much to a man and a woman, you think it was the wrong decision and it's made him weaker. Well, for more on Swella Brubman's sacking and a former Prime Minister David Cameron's return to politics at the front line, delighted to be joined right now by Anne Widdicombe, former Conservative Home Office Minister herself. Good morning, or good afternoon, sorry, to you, Anne. Good afternoon. Good well, morning. Just first of all, I suppose to put the question to you, we're putting to our audience today. Um, was it the right decision for the Prime Minister to sack his Home Secretary? It wasn't right to sack Suella, it wasn't right to bring back David Cameron. Uh, particularly, it wasn't right to bring back David Cameron because everybody will now be wondering who the real Prime Minister is. I mean, we've seen his statement with himself at the very centre of it all. Um, and uh, I, I, I think he's made a very grave mistake, Rishi Shunak. Uh, sacking Suella, there were lots of reasons why he could have sacked Suella uh, before last week. Um, principally that uh, she promises a great deal, doesn't deliver, for example, stop the boats. Well, you know, the boats are still coming. Uh, she doesn't deliver. But when last week she wrote an article that caused all the controversy, then quite inevitably any sacking is seen as based on that. And frankly, an awful lot of people, not just in Parliament, but uh, more importantly amongst the electorate, agree with her. They agree with her. Yeah. And that's the thing, isn't it? A lot of people agree with her. And what I find really strange is, other than, and we talked on the, incessantly about this on the show last week, I disagree with some of her language. I don't think calling people, everyone on that much, being a hate marcher, I don't think that's correct and I don't think it's helpful. I certainly think uh, with where we are in Northern Ireland at the moment, r r making a comparison with marches in Northern Ireland was very, very unhelpful. And, and the sort of gaffe that she makes where she lands herself in hot water unnecessarily, the rough sleepers comment, again, a clumsy comment. She was making a point about America, um, uh, but again, she, you know, she needs to foresee these things if you're going to be a serious politician. But the key thing is, the, the one person we know who agreed with Swella Bradman was the Prime Minister about the substance of that Times article, because otherwise, why would he have called in Sir Mark Rowley, the Met Chief, last week to give him a dressing down and say, you need to, you need to ban this march? Why would he have announced to the number 10 spokespeople this morning that he wants to bring in uh, more laws to toughen uh, the rights of the police, the ability of the police to actually ban extremist marches? I mean, he, he's basically, what he said and what he has done today, basically admitted, she was right and now he sacked her. That, that's a sign of weakness, well, isn't it? I suspect that the reason that he would give is that she refused uh, uh, a 10 Downing Street request to change that and phrase yeah, that was, on, that was, we get. That but, was on Thursday. Yeah, why why wait until Thursday. now to sack her? Because he's now doing a reshuffle. Uh, and, you know, the fact is that very often prime ministers who've got imminent reshuffles, they don't sack piecemeal. Uh, they wait for the shuffle itself. So I don't find uh, that that is odd. All I'm saying is that I think he would deploy the argument that she broke collective responsibility. Mm. I do not know, uh, and uh, nobody knows exactly what communications took place between the Home Office uh, and Downing Street. All I know is I agree with the article. Yeah, I mean, she, of course, I mean, she has made only a very brief uh, statement uh, where she has, I'm just me, trying to find, uh, find the actual words that she uh, said, which I know I've got somewhere, uh, somewhere in this pile. Yes, here we are, uh, where she said, it has been the great privilege of my life to serve as uh, Home Secretary. I will have more to say in due course. Now, that's rather ominous. And Swella Bradman, you are very welcome to have more to say on my show here at Talk TV. Do you get in touch? You know the number. Um, but um, that, that's going to be a bit of a concern for the Prime Minister to have her on the back benches. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people are saying she's a shoe in you know, as a, as, a, as a candidate, if and when we see a, a Tories ousted at the next election, um, and she'd be a, 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 a front runner for that. However, as popular as she is with the Tory party faithful, party members, those con home polls that we see, she is not popular among either the left or the right on Tory parliamentary benches, is she? Oh, she's got quite a bit of support uh, uh, in, within the Tory party. And, of course, we all saw what happened <laughs> over <coughs> Liz Truss. Uh, the party had its say. The party in the country 
rejected the MPs' choice. Uh, and uh, that caused its own tensions. But what I'm saying is that it can be done. That if somebody is very popular in the country, uh, then it is perfectly possible for that person to become prime minister. So it, it could happen. A lot will depend, as you just alluded to, uh, on how much support she can now find uh, on the backbenches. But I suspect there'll be an awful lot of rallying round her. I mean, yep. David Cameron will, will be seen as, you know, the final insult to injury. Well, indeed. Uh, and I mean, I, I had a message from a senior Conservative, uh, got a red wall seat, but a very senior Conservative, who said to me, uh, he said, I can't come on the show, but he said, but you can quote me as saying, I'm beeped off. It involved an F word. <laughs> and uh, I'm be there'll be a lot more of those. But as you say, it's the contrast, isn't it? Suella Braverman out, David Cameron back in. I mean, one of our callers, David, in Glasgow, just made the very fair point. You know, we're talking about David Cameron. He's not a member of Parliament anymore. He's not an MP. He's had to take a, a, a peerage, Baroness, so he can... He can, uh, Barony, so he can actually sit in Parliament, but he's not going to be accountable to MPs. One of the great offices of state, not some junior minister who's sort of a private aide to the Prime Minister, one of the great offices of state, the Foreign Secretary of our country, is not going to be an elected official, ele elected parliamentarian, and is not going to be accountable to elected parliamentarians other than perhaps appearing before a select committee occasionally. Is that tenable in a democracy? Yes, it's tenable. It's been done before. Think of Lord Carrington, who was a very, very effective. It's a long time ago. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe maybe changed. a while ago. Maybe a while ago. But what I'm saying is, this is not unprecedented. Uh, his junior ministers will answer at the dispatch box. Uh, he will answer to select committees. They will probably find other ways as well in which he can be accountable to Parliament. So you don't call him unaccountable. He may not appear, but he's still jolly well accountable for what he does. Yeah. And in terms of James Cleverley's move, he was perfectly happy at the Foreign Office, uh, largely thought to have done a good job, although you and I both know that actually foreign policy is made by number 10. It's not made by the Foreign Secretary um, uh, so much. But it seemed to, you know, very popular figure, um, nice guy. I mean, genuinely very popular with it on Tory ranks and genuinely in Parliament. Uh, he, he's been doing a good job, uh, many, many people perceive, but he's also um, been riding high in the, the personal popularity ratings for Tory party members. It's not, a, not unhelpful for Rishi Sunak to basically put someone in a job where it's easy to be looking very popular and grandstand on the world stage. Put him in a job as Home Secretary where you basically get blamed for pretty much every single thing that goes wrong. That's quite useful for Rishi Sunak for, with a rival, isn't it? Well, had I been Rishi, I would have left cleverly where he was because I think he was doing a good job. You are right, policy's made in number 10, but the presentation of that policy is the be-all and the end-all, quite yeah. honestly, particularly when you've got something as sensitive as the Middle East. Uh, so uh, I, I would have left him where he was. Um, you're suggesting there were political motives behind the move. Um, I doubt it. I think that he was determined to get rid of Suella. He had to ask who to put in there. Uh, cleverly was a very, very competent performer. But the big test will be the same for him yeah. as it was for Suella, which well, he did, failed, And, and very soon one. as well. With Rwanda asylum decision, that case is at the Supreme Court. We're going to get the decision uh, from those judges on Wednesday, whether or not they uh, yeah. have, uphold, have held the government's appeal, whether or not we're going to see those Rwanda flights. Could be next February. Could be. Who are we kidding? Um, whether or not we're going to see calls from backbenchers if it's uh, defeated for us to leave the European Court of Human Rights. Yeah, Julia, Julia, slow down. Leaving the Court of Human Rights. Uh, you know, I actually agree we should leave ECHR. Who is now going to be in charge of that? David Cameron. Can you see him leaving? Can Very you see point. him leaving? It is a nonsense. Do you, just finally, do you read this as many people are getting in touch with us from our audience here at Talk TV are saying that this is an ousting of yet another Brexiteer, more of the old guard, the technocrats, the Remainers back in charge, and that this is, this is not what we voted for? Uh, it's exactly what I think. Uh, and all I can say is this, and I've said it before this morning, uh, in a... I'm very glad that I found the courage to leave the Conservative Party when I did, because I'd certainly be leaving today. Very interesting. Anne Whitcomb, former Conservative Home Office Minister. Indeed, thank you so much indeed for joining Sam Armstrong's the commentators joining me all this morning. What do you make of what Anne Whitcomb has to say? Well, I think she'll be speaking for an awful lot of people that we've heard texting and calling throughout the show. There was a poll last week that showed that 
more conservative 2019 voters that were peeling off. The biggest chunk are going to won't vote at all. But following after that, it wasn't to Labour, it wasn't to Lib Dems, it was to reform. Yeah. And the truth is, the, the narrative, the undeniable electoral reality of the late noughties, 2010s, is the Conservative Party cannot win cannot win an overall majority if they are losing four, five, six points of support yep. to reform or UKIP. Yep. And that means that Conservative MPs in the north of England will be returning to whatever they were doing before. Rishi Sunak mm. will be flying off to California to take up his new yes. role, earning billions and billions. Yes, many, many have been saying that. Let me just come back to some of the statements we've had today because uh, the new Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, said that while I may have disagreed with some individual decisions made by Rishi Sunak, he is a strong and capable Prime Minister who is showing exemplary leadership um, at this difficult time. He's being a, a very, a, very uh, um, uh, you know, complimentary to him. He's also said that... Um, while he's not been in politics for seven years since quitting as PM just within days of that Brexit referendum vote, he says, I hope that my experience as Conservative leader for 11 years and Prime Minister for six will assist me in helping the Prime Minister to meet these vital challenges. And he says he faces a daunting set of international challenges, including the war in Ukraine, crisis in the Middle East. Again, a lot of people will feel like that yeah, Sunak is having to look to this elder statesman uh, to, to give him advice. Um, equally, we've heard from James Cleverly, the now new Home Secretary, um, saying that it is an honour to be appointed as Home Secretary. The goal is clear. My job is to keep people in this country safe. Funny thing is, of course, I think that's what Suella Braverman thought as well. Yeah. Uh, no mention, though, there in that tweet of the boats. <laughs> is this the end of stopping the boats? Uh, is James Cleverly quite as devoted to that issue as Suella well, Braverman? Well, he'll have to be because it's one of the five pledges. But crucially, if the Supreme Court rules against the Rwanda policy yep. on Wednesday, on the basis that you cannot do that and be a member of the European Court of Human Rights, does James Cleverly have the balls to say and to stand up to the Prime Minister and say, no, yeah. we've got to get out of the ECHR. That's what the British public want. Yeah. I don't care. And, We're going to deliver. And, and, of course, would David Cameron, as the Foreign Secretary, would he would he be pushing for that? By the way, it's emerged that uh, it was uh, William Hague who apparently he brokered the deal uh, for, of course, he's very, very much still very much involved with uh, Rishi Snack. He brokered the deal for uh, uh, Cameron and, and Sunak uh, to, uh, to, to meet. Now, um, Steve Barclay, the Health Secretary, has uh, arrived in uh, Downing Street uh, in the last few moments. Um, that's interesting. Going, going in the front, just wondering what other jobs he could be moved that, to. That tends to suggest he's moving. He's not staying in yes. health. So there's some Otherwise, big changes yes. at health because two health ministers have gone this morning. Yes. So something big is going on in that department. And a difficult brief to have with, with this rising waiting list and, of course, up against one of Labour's best performers, Wes Street, in their shadow. Well, uh, your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast today about the Prime Minister's decision to sack Suella Braverman as Home Secretary. And if it was the right decision, Jerry has texted, they should get rid of Rishi and vote in Braverman. The Tories would have had landslide at the next election. Maureen says, Sunak appointing David Cameron means there is no Tory MP worthy of promotion to ministerial post. And Mick says, we will now watch Farage in the jungle and he will come back and take over the Tories. Honestly, I think Nigel Farage absolutely kicking himself at being away these crucial weeks. Now, Amanda from East Sussex has also got in touch. She's on the line. A good afternoon to you, Amanda. Hi again, Julia. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for calling in. What do you want to say? What do you make of this, uh, this reshuffle? Um, well, I'm very upset that um, they've got rid of Suella. Um, the one thing that really concerns me now is that um, we no longer have a cabinet minister or a PM, for that matter, who is actually willing to tell the truth to the British people about what is going on uh, on the streets of London every weekend. Even though we and can see it for ourselves. Exactly, exactly. This is a complete gaslighting of the British public going on. And it's also, if you don't mind me saying, a very British coup because we now have an unelected PM and an unelected, unelected Foreign Secretary, effectively. No, I'm going to disagree with so, you on the PM thing, because no. I always get frustrated when people say that. We never elect a PM directly. We elect our local MP who might support, you know, supports the leadership of the party. We've never directly elected our Prime Minister. So, you know, okay. it's, I, yeah. I've all, I always push back on that one. But, but yeah, I think, I think an unaccountable Foreign Secretary is, given, yeah. given where yeah. we are with international relations right now, I mean, goodness yes. me, that, that's quite a statement, isn't it? 
Yes, it is. And um, the thing is, what really upsets me now is, are we going to see our capital city under siege by these protests now every single weekend? Because I feel that Rishi Sunak and any, anyone else, you know, that, that wanted to speak out about this, yep. they're not going to now. Yep. Um, are, are we going to be under siege every weekend in the capital? The Jewish people are not allowed, frightened to go out of their, their yep. you know... Well, apparently, door? apparently, yes. You know? Apparently, so, yes. Uh, so, so basically, our capital city no longer belongs to the British people. It belongs to the mob. I couldn't agree with you more. I, genuinely, again, I have to tell my daughter, you ain't going into town this weekend. So that is untenable to continue. But, of course, all whipped up by Suella Bravo, and apparently it's all her fault. Who knew? Um, mm. Great to talk to you, Amanda, in East Sussex. Thank, Thank you, you so Julia. much. Coming up after another break, more on Rishi's next Cabinet reshuffle. We'll be talking to our chief political commentator, Peter Caldwell. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Do not go away. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared out <laughs> at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> so, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am fans. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle <laughs> class. Brave us here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after <laughs> this now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. We have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, no, no. no, no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. Julia Hartley Brewer, you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is continuing his cabinet reshuffle this afternoon. Let's cross back to our chief political commentator, Peter Carbell, for the latest. And Peter, good afternoon to you. Some breaking news in the last couple of moments. That's right, Julia. Therese Coffey, the uh, Environment Secretary, she has resigned. There's been a letter that has gone to Rishi Sunak. He's replied, thanking her for her service. She has uh, served all five 
Conservative Prime Ministers. She was Deputy Prime Minister to Liz Truss during her 49 days in office. She served as Health Secretary, Work and Pensions Secretary, most recently Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Secretary. She's been around Conservative politics for quite a while, but has decided the right time has come to go. Whether that was her decision or not, I'm sure we will find out Oh, I think we can in, safely uh, say she, it was not. I yeah. was not the most risible, although quite amusing appointment was when she was made a health secretary. Um, sort of uh, some <laughs> medically obese, cigar-smoking, heavy-drinking. Uh, I just thought, what, I mean, why not? It was quite a good, fun, uh, fun move. But here's the thing. She was a really close ally of Liz Truss, wasn't she? I mean, really old friends, really, really close. And when Liz Truss became Prime Minister, her big thing was, if you didn't support me first time round, you ain't anywhere in the government. And that meant that she didn't have that wide range of support. She had a very narrow base, which then quickly collapsed. Rishi Sunak, quite the opposite, kept, you know, Jeremy Hunt, who for some reason everyone seems to think he should be in government. I don't understand. I don't think he should be anywhere near government. But he had a wide range of people from across different parts of the party. But, you know, she's seen as very much a Liz Trussite. He's got rid of her. Not the greatest performer either. We've also seen Rachel McLean, a housing minister. She's been asked to stand down as well. She's been quite a popular figure. Um, we've also seen Steve Barclay, the health secretary. Very good media comment, media performer. He's very, been very robust on the health strikes and the like. Um, strong Brexiteer, by the way. Um, he's been called into number 10. Now, if you've been called into number 10, you're going through the front door. I'm assuming you're going to, A, get a job, but B, you are going to be reshuffled. Well, yes, indeed. And I think there has been some frustration with Steve Barclay in number 10 for some time in terms of perhaps not doing what uh, some of the senior people in number 10 wanted him to do. We'll see where he goes. Could he be off to environment? That might be uh, something that would be sort of a sideways and down a little mm. bit. Obviously, health is one of the highest spending departments. But you're right about uh, Therese Coffey. She was a big and close ally of Liz Truss, part of, uh, some people called it the Norfolk Mafia, uh, her <laughs> uh, constituency and Liz Truss is there as well. Uh, and there certainly uh, Rishi Sunak tried to, a little bit anyway, build something of a coalition yes. in his cabinet, a very, very fractured Conservative Party. And the fact that uh, Dres Coffey has, got, has gone, that will be seen as someone from the Truss area, era who is expendable, yeah, uh, someone exactly. who's been around for, for quite a long time. Well, indeed, I'm just wondering who would take over as, um, as health secretary. Again, difficult brief when we look at Steve Barclay's job. He's up against West Treating, who's one of the better uh, Labour performers, um, and, and who they would want to, you know, to, to put in that role. A lot of people have been getting in touch with us, basically, this morning, or audience. I mean, to a man and a woman saying they don't like the, the sacking of Suella Bravman, they don't like the appointment of David Cameron, one caller making the very... David in Glasgow, very... Good, fair point that you know he won't be accountable to MPs. He's a, he's a peer. He's not elected by anybody. He's not accountable to MPs. He can't be questioned on the floor of the House of Commons. Um, so that isn't one of the great offices of state. This does. This is just you know that the, someone like Suella Bradman who is speaking for ordinary Britons and saying what most of us would think was like I don't know, some of her language is a bit choice, um, but saying the truth to most people. Um, that this just feels like an establishment takeover. And there is the question as well with David Cameron as to his wisdom on foreign affairs matters. Syria, he planned an intervention there that was blocked by Parliament. Libya went terribly wrong, very, very badly. Uh, and there are many, uh, his closeness to China, for example, there are a lot of hawks on the sort of Ian Duncan Smith, Tom Tugendhat side of the party in regard to China, not happy with David Cameron's attitude to China historically. There's also the fact that he was ca caught up in a lobbying scandal in regard to Greensill. There are still criminal charges outstanding against others uh, who, who were involved with that company, not yeah, just, David just Cameron himself, us, of course. Just remind us a little bit about that, because this was something that emerged about, you know, actions that the prime, then former Prime Minister was taking in the early stages of the COVID pandemic, when lots of us were worried about, you know, elderly relatives and making sure people were safe and children not getting schooling and people dying. And there he was, lobbying ministers, senior civil servants, aides, trying to get a meeting so he could help his mate who he was working for make more money and get government deals. Not a good look. And that is a big question for what former prime ministers do, what they can, mm. what sort of jobs they can do, but certainly absolute scandal in regard to Greensill. And David Cameron's star waned quite dramatically yeah. as a result of that. Uh, there are various... For, there are seven living former prime ministers. Most of them try to... Uh, obviously, Most they are political the figures... <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed, some of them we hear from from, from quite a lot. Uh, obviously, the rare interventions every two or three days from Tony Blair, uh, and others we hear very little from. Uh, so there are there are a wide range of ways that people sort of attack 
that rule, but certainly David Cameron was caught up in that scandal. There'll be many questions about that in the days to come. So uh, it, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a barnstorming blockbuster appointment in terms of a dramatic news. But whether yeah. it is the right one is a very, very big question for Rishi yeah. Sunak. Oh, just also, Richard Holden, another Tory minister, he's just arrived at Downing Street to see whether, what job uh, he gets. Um, just, um, just finally, Suella Braverman, after the uh, sacking, she issued a very small, short statement. It has been the greatest privilege of my life to serve as Home Secretary. I will have more to say in due course. Very much invited on this station, on this show, Suella Braverman, uh, to, uh, to, to say what you want to say in due course. That's pretty ominous, though, isn't it? Uh, don't you think, Peter? I, I, I would say she will have a heck of a lot more to say in due course, Julia. I think there are going to be... It is going to be a real thorn in Rishi Sunak's side. And, and, I mean, they didn't have much control over her, or her when she was home secretary. They have zero yeah. control over her now. She can say and yeah. do whatever she wants and Absolutely. the thing she really wants, and I think might get, is leadership of the Conservative Party Absolutely. in due course. Peter Cobble, thank you so much for joining us. I have to say to everyone, basically, it's a general rule. You know it's going to be a busy day in politics if Peter's taken a well-earned day off. And when he takes a day off on holiday, then you know it's all going to kick off and everything's going to hit the fan, as it has done. So thank you very much, Peter. On your holes, not, not somewhere very glamorous by the looks of it, <laughs> for talking to us. Thank you very much. Let's come back to Sam Armstrong in the studio. Final words. We're just going to finish the show, but, like, final words on a, where we are with this reshuffle, what the Prime Minister has done. Weaker, weaker right now than he was at 8 o'clock this morning or stronger? This feels like a reshuffle that is by, for and with the support of Westminster that could very well cost the Prime Minister in places like Wolverhampton and Wigan. Yep. This is an establishment reshuffle. Many of those that have spent their lives in and around Westminster have done very well. Yep. So far, those that have done less well are those that perhaps spoke for those outside Westminster. Exactly. We will only really know when the Prime Minister goes to the country next year what the public quite made of this. Yeah, exactly. It just seems to me it's one of those things that this is a, this is a sacking, this is a reshuffle that is geared around pleasing Lib Dem voters, Labour voters, people who work for The Guardian, people who write the BBC website. I mean, those people aren't going to vote for you, Rishi Sunak. There are other people who will, who were voting for you, and they have just basically been told Two fingers, no one's interested in your votes. Uh, we, we, we're going elsewhere. I think this is an absolute disaster. I think he's he's absolutely weakened himself. Uh, an, I say an unaccountable, unelected foreign secretary, a home secretary, former home secretary on the back bench is ready to cause trouble. This is going to be the day that he will rue in the future. Sam Armstrong, great to have you join me. Very lively show. It's gone very quickly. Sadly, we have come to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join me same time tomorrow. Up next, it's Kevin O'Sullivan and Alex Phillips. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>